Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SoxProspects.com podcast, the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Worcester, across the Pike to Fenway, and all stops in between. Thank you all for listening after a brief hiatus. We are back. My name is Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of Sox Prospects, and I found Waldo, our director of scouting, Ian Cundell, who's been traveling here and there and everywhere in the name of scouting your uh, favorite or maybe guys you don't know to be your favorite yet Sox prospects in the system welcome back from greenville ian how was south carolina uh south carolina was lovely the drive and their staff are uh great and um top notch yeah it's it's a great ballpark it's a great town and uh, it was great to get down there again for i think this is i don't know several like the fourth or fifth straight year I've been down there. So my obviously not including the pandemic. Yeah, I was going to so, say uh, not including 2020. Yeah. So yeah, Definitely. it's, uh, it's, it was great to get back there and uh, get back out to the field and watch seven games in six days. Cause you've got a lot yeah. of double header. Yeah. I didn't realize. So the double header was it, it was a rescheduled game from earlier in the year. Yeah. It was really awkward too, because Greenville got walked off on their home park. <laughs> right. Which you was just that uh, it was update. so awkward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was it was really bad. It was like one of those things that's like worst case scenario for getting walked off in your home ballpark. <laughs> yeah. 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 It yeah, wasn't ideal, tough. but that's tough. It was uh it was it was good. It was good to check in on, on those guys and um good for the scout. Good. Yeah, and good to uh Greenville is just a lovely place to, you know, get to walk around. The, the falls area is really nice and just there's some good, really good food down there too. So it's fun. All right. Well, we've got plenty to talk about from your trip to Greenville. You also saw a bunch of Worcester recently. So I want to talk to you about the Worcester Red Sox as well, especially with it being September and September call-up season. And I think we're more Ian, more or less ready to write off the playoff chances of the Boston Red Sox at this point. I think we're down to the low single digits in terms of playoff chances. Are we ready to to pull the plug on that one? Um, never say never. I mean, they had a twenty and six month earlier in the season, but unless they do something like that, it's going to be really difficult, right? And I think that I mean, and they need so much help to do it too. So, at any rate, um, fair enough. Well, we've got plenty to talk about here, and of course, your emails. Uh, but of course, if you want to support the show, there's a few ways you can do that. Tell your friends, tell a neighbor, tell uh, tell the person at the dog park that you just met, uh, even though you've lived within two blocks of each other for three years and they're moving and you just met them. Not that that's something that specifically happened to me today, but if that happens to you, you should tell them about the show. Tell them to listen in. You can of course rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. If they've got a rating and review system, please do so. And of course you can support us on patreon.com slash socks prospects, pledge a certain amount per episode, get some neat perks. You get access to the Patreon game updates. Ian just cranked out. I think there are, five up no because i've got the double header and i think it was four days there's five up two more coming uh rankings content exclusive to patreon uh a lot of neat perks up there we're we're gonna record at some point probably this off season at this point the uh bad news bears episode that we need to record so yeah definitely check us out on patreon.com slash socks prospects and of course if you've got want to send an email send it to podcast at socks prospects.com we want to talk about what you all want to hear about but Ian, let's start with the latest news, which is really no longer latest because it's been a few weeks since we've recorded an episode. A lot has happened in the system. ton of promotions. I guess just to knock off a couple of really quick things. First, the rookie ball leagues, are their seasons are over. The Florida Complex League and the Dominican Summer League, or at least they, the Florida Complex League is done. The DSL might still be going, but the Red Sox teams are eliminated. So the Red Sox rookies are done for the year. The F Florida Complex League Red Sox, who play down in Fort Myers, made it to the playoffs, lost to the Yankees in the one-game semifinal. Um, pretty good year. Extremely talented team down there. A lot of guys we're going to be talking about all offseason, probably reviewing their season. Uh, a lot of really interesting guys we're going to talk about right now because nine of them got promoted to Salem, which is kind of unbelievable. And I cannot remember. I mean, I guess they used to do that from rookie ball up to Lowell, but Lowell also had a, a larger roster, right? I think Lowell had 35 and you would see like seven guys come up from the rookie league. Yeah. I, I think it just shows how much of a talent rate though there has been in Salem with the guys going up to Greenville too. So I think it was just kind of making up for the lack of promotions for the entire FCL season while Green or while the Salem roster has just been slowly like but surely had guys matriculating up to Greenville. 
It's true, although it's kind of funny because like they still have Edinson Polino, they still have Brian Arbonasi, they still have um Eduardo Lopez is still there, who's still getting at bats. Um, the pitching staff was is still pretty interesting. Right, but, but I think there's just there's there just more room. playing time now because like there Hickey's is. gone, Jordan's gone, Meyer's gone, um uh Cavadas is gone from there. Wickelman Wickelman mm-hmm. Gonzalez is gone. Like yep. they, which is they, recent. they they yep. promoted like Juan and Carnacion recently. Like there's yep. just, you know, that's a bunch of guys who were replaced throughout the season without really getting a replacement who, mm-hmm. you know, needs consistent at bats. And that's sure. with the FCL season over. It was worth giving a couple of those, you know, first round picks and some other interesting guys. IFAs. Um, yeah. Look. yeah. Yep. Yep. One hundred percent. So um playoff season, yeah, the playoff ended in the FCL with their loss in the semifinals. Um, the DSL Red Sox red did not make the playoffs on a tiebreaker, which is rough. Um, the tiebreaker being head to head record with Astros orange, uh, for the last spot, there's six divisions in the DSL and two wild cards. And they lost out on the second wild card. DSL Red Sox blue was the number two seed. They were kind of a steamroller all year. They won their first series, but lost their second. And they basically just ran out of pitching. Um, they had three really good uh, starting pitchers for them this year who were on, I guess not on the IL because they don't really use an injured list because it's a 35 man roster. But, um, you know, they, they basically, they won their first best of three series on the arms of William Colmenares, Luis Cohen and Christian, Nune- Christian Nunez, who were all very good and had very good years. And then they just didn't have any more starting pitching in there because Inmer Lobo, Yisrael Burnett, and Juan Carlos, Jean, uh, it's not Juan Carlos, John Carlos Reyes are all hurt apparently because they haven't pitched in two weeks or, or a month in a couple of their cases or more. So ran out of pitching, which kind of stinks, but such is life in baseball sometimes. So um, good, another good year down in the DSL as well. A lot of really good guys who were interesting to follow, and we're going to have plenty of content on them, I'm sure. Uh, coming up in the off season where we recap those seasons. One last thing before we get to promotion season, we got the player to be named later in the White Sox, Jake Diekman, uh, Reese McGuire trade, which uh, the main thing I was happy about Ian is that we got the player to be named later before we got months of questions about, Hey, when are we going to hear about the player to be named later in this trade, which always happens because they always wait like the full six months. Uh, and it's right-hander Taylor Broadway. You got a, Good, a pretty good scouting report on him, Ian. Uh, he was a college closer at Mississippi as a fifth year, as a COVID senior in 2021. Was drafted in the sixth round by the White Sox. Uh, was in Double A already, even though he's a 2021 draftee. Um, so a quick rise. Think like Nico Cavadas. Um, pretty interesting guy for a player to be named later. I, definitely not just the throw in was my my takeaway. But w- what did you think? Well, I also think that. I would rather have Reese McGuire than Jake Diekman like on his own. Right. Right. So, um, considering I, the money, especially. Yeah. I think Reese McGuire has been like a solid catcher. I think he looks like he can be at least like a solid, like, you know, guy who can catch 30, 40% of your games. Sure. So, um, yeah, that, that alone, but Broadway. Yeah. He was their sixth round pick. As you said, got 30 K bonus. So he's a senior sign. Uh, fastball is like 92 to 94 this year tops out at 95. He did top out at 97 in college. I read, but he hasn't shown that velocity in pro ball. Um, especially this year, uh, he's good control, but his command is bad. And as a result, he just gets like lit up, which is really weird. When you look at his numbers, it's very strange, like 49 innings in double a this year, um, (laughs) 74 strikeouts, which is really good, obviously. And 13 and a half, which yeah, yeah, 13 and a half case per nine as as a way to kind of 14, 14 walks, which is great. But yep, he's given terrific. up 58 hits and eight home runs. And his bad <laughs> yeah. up against is like 450. So it's weird. Uh, it's, it's a very command driven thing. If you watch his fastball, it's it's pretty flat fastball. There's just not a lot of movement to it. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're off with that, you're gonna get hit. But um, he's got a pretty good slider too, 85 to 87, kind of short horizontal, but he can get it out of bury it down and away from righties. And then he also has a curveball like 79 to 7, 79 to 82. Uh, more vertical, like 12 to six, six breaking ball. But yeah, I mean, he's got like three pitches They he's gotten whiffs with all of them. It's just yep. command consistency. And uh, maybe they try to like tweak his fastball to get a little more movement on it because it's just getting really hit very hard, but he's definitely an interesting guy. And as you said, it's kind of a throw in the deal. You like taking a chance on power arms like that. And you forgot the most important thing. 
what that his dad's a professional bowler. Heck yeah, man. He's got a pretty great like pencil mustache going too. Like he looks like he could uh, be a professional bowler. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I just thought that was funny. You you were the one who was freaking out not freaking out about it. You were the one who was really happy about it and pointed that out. I was I was glad you found that. I did. I thought you were. were you no, not? I had no idea until there's you someone in the Slack. It. Oh, there's it, someone it in probably the Slack. Jimmer. I thought it was you. Might be might have been might have been James. Yeah. Anyway, I, I thought it was you. No. Anyway, well. That's what I get for trying to give you credit. Um, just kidding. Uh, so, okay. Taylor Broadway, he's going to Portland, by the way. Uh, hasn't reported yet, I don't think, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if he pitched in the next day or two. Um, promotion season in full effect. Lots and lots of stuff to get to. Let's well, I think work it, it, it's also going to continue because like Greenville and Salem end next week, but Portland doesn't end until like the 16th or something. And Really, Worcester goes to the twenty eighth. Yeah. I, I know Worcester goes longer, but they also yeah. Worcester still has like even after the September, September call ups, they still have thirty guys. Yeah, but I so just like they don't really the, need. I don't know the Portland season. I didn't realize this that it goes like farther than the high A and low A season. I didn't know that. Yeah, until Portland's recently. also fighting for a playoff spot too. They they because the put playoff half. tickets they put yeah, playoff so tickets on sale today. Portland goes till the eighteenth. Okay. Where is Salem like, and, and, and Greenville? Greenville and Salem and um, the ten, 11th. So the, the okay. Portland has an extra week. And then obviously Worcester goes till the 28th, which is when the MLB regular season was supposed to end, which I think is a great change. That's what it should be. It should line up. Yes, because no you question. Never know when you're going to need guys, especially with only 28 man rosters now. Rehab assignments. Too like you want somewhere that a guy can go play and rehab if he's going to come back like well, rather exactly than, so like, that take swings at JetBlue like yeah so that's why I, I think that that's a great change but yeah so yeah. it's just going to be weird though because there'll be a week of between that and so we might see some more promotions is what I'm saying in September which I feel like is something we don't we hadn't seen in the past would be like these this late because most seasons obviously were over by Labor Day in the past. Mm-hmm. Let's start since we already referred to the lowest point of the system. Let's work our way up on the promotions. Does that sound right? And a lot of guys who are really interesting going up to Salem. Um, over the past, you know, there were the guys who were called up after the FCL season, and there were a few guys who got called up before. The ones who got called up before were the, the big one was Luis Perales, the right hander, um, as well as Luis Talavera, who's like a piggyback guy. And then after the season ended, they called up Mikey Romero, Abram Liendo, Luis Ravello, Roman Anthony, Juan Chacon, Alan Castro, um, Elmer Rodriguez Cruz, Jose Ramirez, and Michael Valera. A lot of guys there. A lot of stuff we could talk about. And it's 11 dudes in a 30-man roster. Um, big ones to me are obviously Romero and Anthony as the two biggest bonus draftees from this year. But really, most of those guys are interesting. Perales is the one. The only ones who aren't ranked are Talavera, Ramirez, and Valera. I think because we we added Castro this this update that just happened yesterday. So that's yeah. And Ramirez is kind of interesting too. I remember he's a, right. yeah uh, yeah. He, like 100%. I know he's old. He's like twenty three, but he signed has late. very yeah. He's signed late, and his stuff is like pretty good. He had some really. He was kind of a trick or treat guy in uh, the FCL this year, where he'd go you know five innings, ten strikeouts, and then he'd just get absolutely lit in his other starts. Yeah, but um, yeah, even he's like an interesting guy, and I, I think before we get into him, should we just mention that Miguel Blaze would be there if he wasn't hurt? Yes. Like I feel like that's something that people would want to know. Like. And, and I think I, Brian Abraham came out and said it in an interview with um, Chad Jennings today that Blaze would have been in Salem if not for his injuries. And yeah. so he he showed more than enough. And I, and I can say confidently he would have been there for a while. It wouldn't have been like he wouldn't have been promoted with these guys. Um, it wasn't a wait till the end of the season thing. It was just unfortunately he picked up a back injury at an opportune time, which has ended his yeah. season. But um, I, I think that's worth yeah, mentioning. He, I had reported um, last week or whenever, whenever the promotions happened, because I when I got the promotions, it was like, what about other? I presume Blaze is just too hurt, and it was like he's he's back doing baseball activities, but we just didn't see a reason to push it. What was the quote? Just his health is the of primary importance right now, and as long yeah. as he's healthy, we're happy. I'm sure he'll yeah. be back for whatever fall program they wind up doing if right. they do one, he's, presumably. Exactly. So um, let him go home, recoup, rest up, get the back in, in order, and come back for. You know, if it's the fall performance program again or whatever, like come back for that, ready to go, um, which is a good opportunity for them to get their best guys together with 
you know, a lot of their coaches. So it makes sense to make sure he's ready for that rather than push him to have two weeks in Salem. Right. So uh, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it's just tough, cause it's just, it's okay. just tough though. Cause he would have gotten more than two weeks. He would have been there for like a month or so. So that would have, Oh, been nice oh for the beginning. Him. Sure. Yeah, I'm saying from yeah. when he got healthy, but right, yeah, exactly. if he had, yeah. if he hadn't gotten hurt, he would have been there. I mean, I think, I, I think I even reported like when he was first hurt, he had only been out for about a week and it was like, what I was basically hearing is like, when he gets back, it's not going to be long before he's up in Salem, yeah. but then like it stretched another two weeks. <laughs> so then it's like very different. Um, you know, you got to get your timing back and everything. You don't want to have a guy doing that while he's up at a new level. Uh, I mean, there's really not a whole lot of stuff to say about, I mean, the guys got promoted. It's good. Um, I don't really know that there's a whole, whole much, a whole lot more to say about it. I don't know if there's anyone there that surprised you Ian, and I don't think there's anyone that surprised me. Um, except for maybe like Valera, but you like, you know, always know like a reliever is going up and it's just tough. You know, you don't want to go based off just numbers and he had pretty good strikeout rate. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, no, no one that they promoted, uh, surprised me. No. It'll be, it, it will be interesting to see how many of them actually get in the games. Cause as of now, only, uh, Castro Romero, Chacon and Anthony have gotten in the games. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if like Ravello actually does play or people like that. Um, yeah, it's interesting because of the fact, because the thing is, is that Salem has Bonasi and Polino who they want to still have getting every day at bats. And it's right. not like you can just promote them because you have a second baseman and a shortstop in Greenville, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Right. So it's like, exactly. It's tough. So yeah, it's, um, it, it's no, it's, it, it's good to see that those guys are getting rewarded. Obviously they had a really great season down in the FCL and there's just a lot of promising talent there. Um, good good you know good opportunity for Romero and Anthony to get comfortable in the area where they're likely to spend most of next season and similarly like someone like Perales getting up and getting just more consistent starts under his belt yep. belt is encouraging um because yep. he's 100%. obviously uh, of the pitching guys he's by far the best prospect in that group so yeah it's uh it's it's a good crew and it's a very the Red Sox low minors is very talented these days mm-hmm. uh, and some guys moving up from one low minors team to another up to Greenville where Wickelman Gonzalez and Luis Guerrero who we'll talk about in a little bit uh, as well as recently, Juan Daniel Encarnacion and uh, Graham Hoffman. So, a bunch of arms going up. The bats that were going to move up were probably already there. Nothing wrong with Polino and Bonasi spending the whole year um, in uh, in in Salem. So I've got no problem. Well, with yeah, because there's nowhere to play them either. Right. Like Meyer York, um, Meyer York Lugo, Lugo yeah. play every day. Bla- Blaze Jordan, Jordan too. You want him getting third base third reps? Base. Yeah. Tyler McDonough is playing shortstop also like they just don't they don't have room for more infielders there I mean we'll, we'll talk about this when we talk about Greenville but I found it funny that like did you see Lugo play anything but third I don't think so I, right no no he he only played third base he's which is interesting playing, because he's like, not playing shortstop anymore yeah like McDonough think. played two or three at short and then like Max Ferguson got a game at short yeah, he like, didn't play a single game at shortstop. Yeah, and I yeah. he he didn't take in in infield outfield. Obviously, he didn't either because he was only playing third base in the games. So he only yeah. took ground balls at third. He took some like stuff in BP at shortstop, but it was nothing like serious. Yeah, but yeah, no, I I he I was told he probably wasn't a shortstop, and I, I think that it, that might this might be the beginning of that transition since it's just the Red Sox have Meyer there, and next season and they have in Portland, York at second. Yeah. yeah, next season in Portland. Um, you know, they don't really have a shortstop, I guess, you know, looking at it like, so maybe if you presume, they, sorry, I didn't mean, if you presume Meyer starts in Greenville, correct, which, which he's going fair. to, he's going to, um, maybe, yeah, I mean, does maybe Ferguson they try move back, up, Probably but not. well, no, the thing, maybe they McDonough and Ferguson split time at short there. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if they I go mean, back to it next spring training. If Raphael is in, Port- in Portland to start next year, he gets his one game a week at short too. Right. So it'll be interesting to see what they do yeah. in Lugo next year, but I wouldn't be surprised if that, that ship has sailed and they they're trying him. He's yeah. now like more or less a third full-time third baseman. And I'm surprised uh, maybe, it's third, not just not second. I mean, York's there though. Like, yeah, well, right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. Thank you. So, yeah. Good point. Good yeah. point. I just thought that like, you know, you would, maybe he would be the guy at second when York gets a day at DH or a day off, but that isn't even really how it's played out either. No, I think he played four times at third and twice at DH when I was there. Yeah, because um, they're getting McDonough the reps at second when they have second base days that that York's not playing, and Ferguson. So I um, McDonough anyway. only played shortstop when I was there, but maybe he did. Um, but he's been playing a fair amount of second base as, yeah. as, as a general point. When, when uh, I was who, there, he only played second. Or who was the short. backup second baseman then when you were there? Ferguson. Ferguson? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
that makes sense. Yeah, that trade put a lot of stress on that roster. Um, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. And Mc, oh, oh no, that was in Rome. Yeah, so he played second base this series, but in yeah. the Greensville series, McDonough played left field, center field, center field, shortstop, shortstop, center field. Yeah, that so, sounds right. Yeah. Uh, moving up from high A Greenville to double A, Shane Drohan happened back right around our last episode. Uh, that had been a long time coming. That wasn't surprising at all. Um, and then other promotions since then, the big promotions day was Nico Cavadas and Cody Scroggins. And then Ryan Zephyr John recently, who I think we'll, we'll mention Zephyr John real quick because he was still in Greenville when you saw Greenville. Um, Cavadas being the really interesting one there, not terribly surprising. And I, we had kind of pointed mid-August as like, if he's still hitting like this, he easily could go up to Portland and get another promotion. Um I saw some people tweeting about like, does this mean they started him too low? I don't think so. I think that's I don't think it matters either of, way. He was yeah. he was going to finish the season in Portland. So I mean, he he hit it's his way to well. Portland. Yeah, yeah, he hit his way to Portland. He's at the age appropriate level now, and now it's like the true test of what he is because there was I mean, he wasn't getting tested in the low minors. So we'll no, see, yeah. and it's we'll, we'll it's, give him a good idea of what he is now. It's funny because like in August in Greenville, his power had fallen off, but it was interesting because like his on base was still up and he was getting walk. He was walking a ton and reading into it. It's like, I bet he's just not getting anything to hit. This is actually pretty interesting. Sorry. uh, I didn't want to go back to Lugo, but he hasn't played shortstop since the, the second uh, or the third of uh, August. And then he moved, he went there last night in the game. Uh, He went into shortstop when it looks like Ferguson got hurt or pit got pinch hit for something happened. And yeah. uh, Lugo ended up moving to short, maybe because Meyer had the day off. But I don't know. I just thought it was interesting that he literally, yeah, he went basically a full month without playing shortstop in games. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, Cavadas in Portland, very small sample. It's only 11 games, but uh, 206 average, 400 on base, 353 slugging. Um, and I think this, I mean, it looks right. I mean, the strikeout rate is now, it, it, you know, it's at 28.9. Uh, it's right around where it's been. It's actually a little higher than where it was in Salem and Greenville, but same ballpark. Um, average on balls and play has come down from where it was in Salem and Greenville. It's basically what we I kind of yeah, thought better, we were going to better, see. Better defense, better pitching. Yeah. Um, he's still going to walk because he's got a really good approach. Yep. But no his question. swing and miss will be tested because it's just better stuff. Like, you know, you're going to be facing. I mean, just think about like Eastern League pitchers. Um, some of the guys that I've seen this year, are like who are up there right now, like Griff McGarry with Redding, like Ricky Harrison. Tyden, uh, yeah, Kyle Harrison. Like Eastern League has some good pitching. Uh, Quinn Priester with Altoona. Like, mm-hmm. I don't exactly, I don't remember who they're playing right now, but um, like I think the they pitching, saw Priester last week, actually. Yeah, the pitching is just so much better. And the gap is, I, we've mentioned on this podcast before, the gap between high A and double A is as, it's high, in my opinion, as, as it's been in years. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you're just seeing like there's a lot of, this is the first test and it's something we've talked a lot like blaze Jordan too. Like we need to see what he does at double a, that's the first big test. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of turning into the sink or swim level with guys. I mean, we're seeing like, right. We'll see what Cavadas can do there, but like, you know, someone like Alex Benellis has really struggled with this promotion. Mm-hmm. Um, Nick Northcott, mm-hmm. same thing. So it's going to be like, it's going to, it's, you know, it, this is a, this is a big test for him. And uh, it's good to see, you know, kind of what he's doing up there and we'll have a good idea for the rest of this year. And then in the next year, and then not too many guys gone from Portland to Worcester. Just the, the really big ones are the starters, Victor Santos, and then Brian Mata, um, ranked seventh in our rankings right now. Mata, I think you've got you had it right, and I I, I just kind of wanted to explore why I think you had it right. I was surprised that he had not been up to Worcester yet, and I had kind of said it's a little surprising that he hasn't gone up yet. And you you kind of said, well, why do you think that he's not at you know pointing out how many innings he had in Double A, which is a good point. I had been thinking of it as, well, he was at the alt site. We still don't really know what the alt site counted for, if anything. And it looks like the answer is not much. And I think, I, I think, think it's the, not much. Yeah. And I think the reason they got there is because I, I, like we were talking about, it, I'm like, well, if you look at everyone that was at the alt site, they basically got promoted the next year from where they were in 2019. Whereas Mata went back to where he was in 2019, in 2022, after Tommy John. And to me, I think part of it might be that they learned lessons of like, was Jeter Downs promoted too fast? You know, were they too aggressive with guys coming out of that and assuming that there was more developmental use of that, right? So I think that's maybe, I don't know, maybe where that comes from, but they promoted him right around 100 innings, which was, I think, right around where Bayo was when he got promoted to AAA. 
Um, yeah, that seems to be the benchmark for pitchers right now. Well, starting pitchers, I should say. Yeah, starters. About 100 yep. innings. And uh, yeah, he literally is, you know, 53.1 in 2019 and 48.2 this year. So yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah, he crossed it in that start and got up the next yeah, day. So. By one inning, it was gone the next day. So yeah. Yep. Yep. So, it, you know, interesting to, to see that and just see how it does seem like it's a different approach than they had with the other guys at the off site and maybe shows, you know, lessons learned perhaps. Um, but those are the two from there. And then I guess talking really briefly, Ian, about 40 man roster call ups and the calls we saw the other day. So the other day, the Red Sox, Red Sox, not the Red Sox. I'm hungry in case you can't tell. The Red Sox designated for assignment, Hirokazu Sawamura and Austin Davis and called up Zach Kelly and Caleb Ort. Ort had already been on the 40-man and had already been up this year, obviously. Zach Kelly finally making his major league debut. If you've listened to this podcast, you know about Zach Kelly. That's We we have been, talk, we've been talking about it. Credit to you, Ian, for Thank identifying you. him. No question. Yep. Um, uh, he, and he looks great. Yeah, two, he looks two, really two good. Two scoreless innings. I think he's got four three strikeouts or four strikeouts in those two innings. Hell of a people week. Are, <laughs> people are seeing the stuff. Like That's the thing yeah. that I, I, I feel like we try to tell like the fastball is good. You know, he's up into the mid nineties and the changeup is very good. The changeup is the best individual uh, secondary pitch of the relievers in Worcester. And that's a separator pitch. You know, when you have 13 to 15 miles an hour of separation, that's just, mm-hmm. that matters. <laughs> Multiple and, ways. Uh, it's a separator pitch. Yeah, exactly. I, I realized <laughs> that after I said that, that was yeah, about, time. I like it. And it, like it. it was funny though, watching like, the way he pitched, and I think Johan Duran came in right after him for the Twins. And Johan oh, Duran is throwing like 101 mile per hour splitters and 103 yeah. mile per hour fastballs. So it's like two miles an hour separation between his fastball and his splitter. And I was like, yeah, but they're d- disgusting. So it's just like yeah. I don't. Johan Duran is a, he doesn't make any sense to me. Like the fact no. that you could throw a no. secondary pitch over 100 miles an hour is absurd. Like yeah. it's kind of bonkers. But yeah, no, Kelly looks great, and I, I'm very interested to see to see what he looks like. Obviously, he's, he's as you said, you're going to mention. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, about he's, to disappear, he's, unfortunately. Yeah, tomorrow. I mean, so we're recording this Thursday night. He's tomorrow. He's leaving because he's about to have his first child. Um, so, so have, have a week, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah have congratulations. A week. Gosh, um, um, I mean, that's yeah. one of those things where it's kind of funny. It's like I guess he got told on the bus ride back from wherever they were, uh, probably Syracuse, I think, right? And uh, yeah, like, they were in Syracuse. Yeah, called his family on the bus, and then like immediately got up to Boston, and it's just kind of like, well, no, he probably stayed Cleveland. there. He probably stayed there and flew out to. They were in Minnesota. Oh, he went to Minnesota, but no, he was on the yeah. bus back from Syracuse. Oh, was he on the back? I thought he flew from Syracuse, but it doesn't matter. I mean, whatever. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. At any rate, um, I thought I already found out on the bus because he like called his family and told them to get out there. But it's like his wife is literally like literally i think the day before on instagram he had posted like one week like until we're due so it's just like all right like that's one of those things where it's like okay this is it inconvenient or is it very good i don't know but at any rate he's going to go away for a few days i'm presuming they're going to call tyler danish up to take I, a I spot for three be, days because as you pointed out darwin does is not even throwing so well he didn't him. throw for two weeks and then he's had two games back since and he's walked four guys and hit a guy and one and two thirds. So I mean I, I it doesn't necessarily have to be Danish though. It could be like maybe they want to try Winkowski out in a long relief role. I don't maybe think they, they will do... though. Like because would they throw him off just to fill in for a guy on the paternity list? Probably not, because right? I, I would assume he's the Although, first depth arm if something happens, but maybe they want to try Seabold again. It's interesting, I don't know. I, actually. I wouldn't no. rule it out. It's not going to be Seabold, because Seabold pitched last night. No, I know it's not going to be Seabold. I'm saying that the Seabold could be, they could view Seabold as sure. their next depth starter, which would all free them up to promote Winkowski. Right, well, so, because here's the thing, is like, in the game notes this week for Worcester, like, Tuesday's game notes had Mata and a bunch of TBA. No, Mata, then Seabold on Wednesday, and a bunch of TBAs. Yesterday's didn't fill anybody in. And today's, I think, just had Victor Santos going tonight and a bunch of TBAs. So I don't know if that means they are considering bringing Winkowski back up. I mean, I could see it. Oh, can like, they I, even? I, well, paternity list, can you bring anyone up? Is no. that like DL? No. No, it's not. It's not like the IL. So it can't be Winkowski then. So never mind. When when was his date? Fairly recent, I thought. I'll bring it up. No. But... It was the 24th. Yeah, they can. Uh, no, that's not. It's 15 it's, days. Yeah, it's not 10 days. You're right. It's 15 days. It's 15 I was now. thinking it was 10 days. Yeah, no. So they can't break. So it's going to be Danish. It's going to be. Yeah, it has to be Danish. I'm the wondering other if they're doing would, TBA. I wonder the if other, someone's hurt. The other option would have been Siebel, but it's it's not going to be him because he started yesterday and he, threw really well. He went well. seven. Yeah, he went seven. He the opposite of when I saw him, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But. <laughs> right. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that works. Um, should, we, 
should we break down? Well, then today there were a couple more promotions. Yeah. So today on the 40 minute for 40, blah, 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 not 40 minute call up day, September call ups, which are only two guys now. It's only 28. The and you have to have to 14, 14. Yep. You have to, so you can't, so you couldn't call up two pitchers like they did last year. Yep. It was pretty clear one of them was going to be Connor Wong, who has been that was the lock of the century, like scorching hot. I mean, he would have been, even if he'd been playing poorly, he was probably coming up. Right. But instead, he's he's on an absolute tear right now. Like he's on one. So yeah, Winkowski can't come back up until like after the eighth. So he's out for a while. Um, yeah, Connor Wong coming up fairly easy. Ian, I tweeted this. I want to see him get some run. Like, see what you've got in the guy. Like, I don't want him to sit on the bench as the third catcher. Yeah, I agree. I'd like to see him. I, I personally would like to see him and McGuire split the reps because I think you still need to play McGuire because I think McGuire is squarely in position to be one of the two catchers on the roster next year. He's under team control, no question. Um, yep. And he's played well enough to deserve it. His defense is good. He's making enough contact, like mm-hmm. he's hitting mm-hmm. okay. Um, but I, I think that other catcher spot is up for grabs. And I think that I, I'm i getting more comfortable with the idea of running out Wong and McGuire as two catchers, but I would like to see Wong get like, you know, 10, 15 games at catcher over the next month Yep, to kind of get a feel for him behind the plate and also, you know, get him some experience with the pitchers. Um, obviously like Pulwecki's catching tonight, which I kind of get actually having Pulwecki catch though, like Rich Hill. Cause I don't think Rich Hill is likely to be back with the team next year. So mm-hmm. yeah. um, I think the more interesting one will be like when it's guys like ba- who catches Bayo, for example, like I'd love to see Wong get that game given he's worked with Bayo at AAA this year. Yep. No question. Um, Although other- you might also want to get McGuire reps with him. Fair, but I, I just think that it'll be interesting to see if maybe they go with like Plawecki catches once or twice a week for the Rich Hill games and, mm-hmm. you know, or maybe Waka, you know, the guys who well, <laughs> are debatable going to be back next year. And then you have, you know, Wong and uh, Wong and Maguire catch the guys who are under team control. It's interesting because Waka generally throws to Plawecki and likes throwing to him and pitches well when he throws to him. But it's also like Waka is a re-sign candidate. He's a strong, like, I think you have to give, I mean, he might be pitching his way into a qualifying offer. He's pitched really well. He's, like, uh, yeah, he, he's he's a re-sign candidate. He's also sneaky young. Like he's only thirty one. Yeah. He seems Just, like he's been around forever. Yeah, I feel like he's been around because he. Well, the thing was because he made the big leagues so quick. Like yeah, after he, he got he drafted, was, he he was drafted in twenty twelve and he was in the big leagues in twenty thirteen. Yeah, and so that's why it feels like he's been around longer than um than he has. They're like sorry, it feels like he should be older because you expect like him as a college guy to spend like there. three or yep. four three years in the minors, but no, he only spent like less than a year. Or so yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean I'd like to see him get some time with Wong and see how it looks. Right. And maybe he likes yeah. throwing to Wong. And maybe that's a hey I, I like throwing to saying like I think be I'd be fine. I'm fine if like Pulecki catches every Rich Hill start and then yeah. the other four starts, you know, you rotate Wong and McGuire, give them each two. Like something like yep. that would be the split I would like to see. Sure. Sure. I get that. The other call up today, Ian, was Edward Bizardo. And I guess yeah. we'll talk about the Port- Worcester guys. I almost said it. We will talk about the Worcester guys, um, of course. But um, what the dog just run? Are you concerned about something, dog? Are you okay? You're concerned about Edward Bizardo. Okay. We'll come here and we'll talk about Edward Bizardo. I had it narrowed down, Ian, to, and I guess we all did. I don't want to say it was me. It was fairly obvious, I think. It was either going to be Edward Bizardo or Frank Herman. Yes. I really liked the point you made. So do you want to make the point you made about why it's Bizardo and not Herman? Because I had said this morning, I had thought it was going to be Bizardo, but I changed my mind to it being Herman more likely because Herman has been Worcester's best reliever numbers wise for two months now. Yeah. But I like your reasoning better than that. Um, well, first off, uh, yeah, Google images, get it right. They have a picture of Brian Bale when you search Edward Bizardo. Oh, no. But um, oh, no. I, the reason I was uh, the reason I was pretty I thought it was going to be Bizardo or why I think it is Bizardo is just that he's a minor league free agent after the year, so the decision has to be made on him more or less right after the regular season ends. So you need to know what you have with him. Someone like German Herman, you don't have to add to the forty man until the Rule Five deadline, and especially if you've already made the decision you're going to add him, which I think they likely have then there's no point in bringing him up because you're not going to learn anything over this next month that is going to going to sway you either way. Um, and the only thing that could sway you is like, maybe you bring him up and he's so bad. You're like, eh, maybe we don't want to protect him, but then you're just going to lose him on a waiver claim, which is right. a deal. Right. Versus with Bizardo, if he's not at, on the 40-man roster at the end of the season, anyone could sign him, right? Minor league free agency starts, what, five days after the World Series or something? Yeah, they were going to have to re-sign Bizardo right quick. So, so, yeah. so by doing this, you know, you already now you got to look at him for a month. 
you see what he has, you know, and then you can decide, you know, in the off season, is he a, someone we, you know, we see as a potential future bullpen candidate for next year, or is he more someone, okay, we, we got our look at him. He's not for us. You know, we'll look to trade him or we'll DFA him in the off season. Yep. And so I just think it makes sense to give him a look and um, kind of, you know, yeah, see, see, see what you can get out of him. Um, obviously he's been, he's been pretty good. The last, uh, the last little stretch, it, it's been weird. I was looking at his splits and like the times he runs into trouble is when he, is going like a second or third inning. Well, but they've been using him as the starter a fair amount when they go bullpen day because they they haven't had five starting pitchers on the roster. Gosh, for most of the year, they've been running a lot of bullpen days. Now, yeah. they've also had like a 10-man bullpen. So, it hasn't been up. Like right now even after the September call-ups, they've got 2 4 6 8 10 11 guys once Hirokazu Sawamura reports. Yeah. I mean, you've got an 11 man bullpen, you can run a bullpen game once a week and you're fine. But it's like interesting when you look like, so if you look at like the games he's given up runs, the last time he gave up runs in it, like a single inning appearance was, uh, was back all the way in beginning of June. Like all the times he's given up like considerable runs is like inning in two thirds, two and a third, two innings, three innings, three innings, three innings. Like it just seems like. Yeah. He's running into issues, you know, when he's facing, when he's going, when he's having to either not, I'd not necessarily turn the bat, the, uh, the lineup over, but you know, mm-hmm. when he's, you know, facing guys, you know, several after for, um, he's getting, you know, through more than four or five batters, a couple up and down. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I'd like to see him in a short relief role, um, kind of see what you can get. And yeah, like, and he's someone who the, the velocity came back. Obviously he had that injury where I forgot he only got like two appearances last year. Yeah. He didn't pitch much at all. Um, it was weird. And he, he obviously got hurt and his stuff was down at the beginning of the year. Like there was a reason that he was able to get off the 40 man completely during spring training, uh, stuff just wasn't back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, by when I, over this summer in Worcester, it started to come back, you know, he's back up to like 95 miles an hour. He's still got the breaking ball in the splitter. And so, yeah, it's going to be, I I think this is a good opportunity for him, um, you know, to pitch his way into consideration for a bullpen spot next year, or at the very least to be one of those like depth, you know, depth bullpen arms that like the Tyler Danish role next year, um, starting in the minors. Yeah. And if I could just make a couple of notes on Herman, um, I mostly agree with, with what you were saying. I think a couple of tweets, I think the thing that he could benefit from is he gets the taste of the majors by coming up this year. I, but I agree with you that it, it might be more important to evaluate Bizarro than it is for Herman to get his first taste of the majors this year. Right. And like, yeah, you're going to add him to the, you're probably going to protect Herman at this point, this off season. I, th- I, I, I think we kind of agree on that. They've got a lot of tough calls, but Herman looks like he's probably trending towards getting protected. Um, but like I said, you could, you know, one thing I'm wondering about Herman is do you send him to Arizona? Right. Like do you send him to Arizona? Yeah, to get work if, out if, there? If, if he's on the 40 man roster, I don't think he can go to the fall league. Right. Ooh. Is that, that still the case? I thought that's what I, I, cause I was having this discussion with someone about Casas recently and I wondered if they wanted to send Casas to the AFL. Interesting. And cause Casas I couldn't find, was time. I, I couldn't find anything in the official rule changes for 2019, but I know that used to be the rule. So if it that's used still to, the rule. Yeah. I don't know. I should ask someone about that. So if that's still the rule, then that would explain to me if that would be a pretty clear, pretty good reason not to, um, not to add him to the 40 man. Same with Casas too. Interesting thought. I had not thought about that. Had not th- we'll have to research that. Good call. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's those are interesting points on Herman and them. Um, let's use that to transition, Ian, I guess, first to Worcester. You Before you went to Greenville, you saw a fair amount of the Woo Sox. Uh, I think you said you, said you went three or four times that week or something like that, or, you, or since the last podcast. Yeah, I, I can't times. remember exactly. It was, I've been to way too many games over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, you've been to a <laughs> lot of games. One guy who I want to really, I really want to hear what you think about is Tristan Casas. Uh, we've talked a lot about him when he's going to come up, both on the podcast and just between ourselves, right? I personally am surprised, have been, I'm sorry, I should, let me rephrase. I have been surprised that he hasn't come up yet because it seemed like there were a couple of opportunities to do so. Um, and I made the point today that you look at the fact that apparently Tanner Houck looks like he might be done for the year. Eric Hosmer is taking longer to come back from his back issue than they thought he would. And it's like, well, if you fall out of the race, do you rush Eric Hosmer back? Mm-hmm. seems like a good chance to add Hoss at Casas to the 40 man and get him some time. 
um, you know, get him that taste of the majors. If he, I mean, look, he has to comp- he'll be competing for a major league roster spot in spring training next year. I don't know that it's a given he comes up next year, but you have to give him the opportunity. I think he'd be crazy not to. If he's one of your best 26, I go north with him. Why, what have you seen from him? Do you think there are development points for him? For the folks who are just looking at, he's hitting the ball really well, statistically. What are you seeing from him in person watching the games? And, and maybe can you relate that back to why he might still have work to do in AAA? Um, yeah, I mean, I obviously he's looked very good. <laughs> um, right. I don't think that's that's like much of a surprise. Like in the, the games, I'm just going to, I actually don't have all my notes here, but the couple of games I have, um, I have here, he, uh, he had uh, in one of the games, he uh he he had a double um he had a double walk you know he's just hitting the ball hard double was still like the other way really good swing and i i think that the things that kind of are holding him back is one just the playing time opportunity when he's down in worcester you know he can play he's playing every game mm-hmm. he's sitting in the middle of the lineup and i think that that's something that they value is him getting those consistent everyday reps whereas if he was up in the big leagues He'd be splitting time with at first it was Eric Hosmer. Now it's, you know, Christian Arroyo, who they definitely want to get at bats to. Uh, Dahlbeck's still there. Cordero's still there. There's just a lot of mouths to feed. And I'm not sure, you know, they want to take at bats away from all, basically just relegate all those guys to the bench in favor of giving Casas every day at bats. And the reason Um, that the reason that's so important is the amount of time he missed with the ankle injury. Yeah. So basically, he's played one full season over the last two years. And right between the Olympics that, too. Yeah, he, I yeah. mean, he's got he's got a hundred. He's this year he's played a hundred and ten games. He's got about three hundred and twenty at bats. Like that's you know usually in a normal season you'd want a minor league guy to get four hundred fifty five hundred bats. And so yeah, he's just missed a lot of time. And I think the other thing is too that he still does need to work on hitting left handed pitching. Um, this year he's hitting two twenty four, three sixty six, two sixty nine against lefties compared to three hundred one, four hundred two, five seventy one against righties. And I think the most drastic switch the most uh there's just a lot he's got a lot of swing and miss against lefties he has 41 strikeouts and 244 uh plate appearances against righties so that's like a 17 percent strikeout rate against lefties it's 27 and 82 so that's a 33 percent strikeout rate so his strikeout rate basically doubles against left-handed pitching and he's definitely i think gotten better against lefties um of late i, I don't know if the numbers can bear that out i'm gonna see if i can get i them. don't know how to do a left hand right hand split i don't think you can in a but, given um, thing yeah i mean what but, i was gonna add is over the last month so he came back from the ankle injury rehabbed in at the F- complex league and he was like two for he had two hits in his first five games back he had four overs since july the 28th through august 31st so a little over a month 336 average, 454 on base, 570 slugging, four home runs in 29 games. Um, 24 strikeouts and 130 plate appearances. I'm cool with that. It's fine. 21 walks, cool. Um, he's hitting. Uh, I wish I could see the split. I noticed, you know, surprised they didn't call him up when Worcester was going to Syracuse. Syracuse had, I think it was eight left handed pitchers on the roster. I remember seeing that and being like, aha. I get why they want him to play against Syracuse. So yeah, and he hit really well that series. He, I think he hit a couple home runs off lefties in that series. Like, and he only I only had one home run that series. Was it uh, one, one home run? Right, one home run, one but home he had run. he had two doubles and a triple as well. That's what it was. Um, but yeah, I, I just honestly think that they want to give him consistent playing time, and especially with Story back now playing pretty much every day. Um, they you need to get a Roy at bats. He's one of the better hitters in that lineup. He's shown to be, and I think first base is the new way to try and get him some at bats too. So I just think that that's the case, but I think that could change. And, and I've been operating under the assumption that Eric Hosmer would be back off the DL in like a normal amount of time. But they said today that I think it was um, Alex Cora said today that Hosmer is being shut down indefinitely. Yeah, the so, back isn't responding. Yeah, that might open the door. Um, that's what I was we'll, thinking. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I just, I, because of the Arroyo factor, I think that's what, if, if story stays healthy and they can give Arroyo at bats at first base, I think that is what will keep him down for now though still yeah i mean the thing is is that you know the people are like well doll back and it's like well first of all doll a backup right now you're not going to replace a guy you want to play every day like a backup with a guy you want playing every day because now you need to create at bats um and plus there's the handedness thing causes being left-handed and, and doll being right-handed you you can't plat- really platoon hosmer and Casas, right 
it, it, the hand they both are left-handed hitters. Yeah, there's a reverse split for Hosmer, but if Hosmer's healthy, I get why you don't have Casas up yet. Um, but yeah, we'll 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 see how they play it out the rest of the year. I think there's a chance he comes up. I think it's more likely to be later in September, just for like a, you know, they could also do the thing. I think uh, Peter Abraham mentioned this. They could also just bring Casas up on the taxi squad, like for the last week or two of the season. But he's still not on the clubhouse. He's not on the forty man though. Yeah, but you don't need to be on the forty man. Uh, you don't need to be on the forty man. No, nope. I could definitely see that. But the thing is, there's no point because I'd rather. I think it's more important for him than I think. Well, that's why I said a week or two. Getting every day. Well, but it's not. It's like four days because the Worcester season goes till the twenty eighth, and the regular season ends like the second of October. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is like you like I'm okay with him missing a week of the Triple A season. Like I get wanting yeah. to get him every day at bats, but him missing six games. Yeah. I don't know. If that I don't know. Happen. I personally would rather the six games. I don't think the like experience of just being in the clubhouse is worth missing. You know, a week of mm. of at bats, given how much time he's missed this year. But that's just me. fair. Fair. I mean, if you're going to send him to Arizona too, maybe it's part of getting him off his feet for a bit. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, we'll be interesting to see how that works. Uh, I guess let's let's kind of we're already <laughs> going pretty long in. Let's tear through. I guess some uh, you know quick hitters on either side of the ball. Um, I want to hear what you think about Emmanuel Valdez, the guy they got from Houston. He's like weird. Him, he's yeah. a weird player. Um, he's very, he's the kind of like, he's built like Jose Ramirez in a sense that he's like five, eight, five, nine, but he's kind of like stock fire hydrant. Fire yeah, hydrant. It, it's, yeah. It's an interesting build. Um, not a lot of projection, obviously, but, and in the field, it's, it's, it's interesting. He, um, <laughs> he's not the most graceful fielder. Um, no, there were a couple plays where like he made like a okay diving play and just like, couldn't, get up to throw the ball oh god i just like fell over it was just like flailing and it was very interesting kind of looked like a beach whale would be was my comparison oh, um, um but yeah no it it, it it second base like it wasn't that bad though like i was expecting given the reports i got i was expecting it to be like pretty bad and mm-hmm. i actually thought he was okay like it wasn't it's not gonna be great don't get me wrong but do i think he could get to a 40 there yeah probably like i think there's a chance of that which would be you know okay if he hits and I think the the reason they got him is the bat. You know, if if yep. if you believe in the bat, then you'll figure out the defense. And uh, it was interesting when I saw him; he was just walking. Like, in one stretch, he saw like fourteen straight balls. Like he just stood there. Like it was it was not a lot. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that he he's got a good swing. Um, it's unique. There there's definitely some weird stuff. Like he starts with his foot like like contorted inwards and has this like kind of weird hitchy leg kick um that is pretty unique but he, you know he gets the he gets in a good hitting position eventually and he's got some pop for someone his size like he, he can drive the ball um his bp is impressive and um yeah i mean think since the red Sox got him like there's there's definitely some swing and miss in the game and he's not hitting that well he's like 202 300 i think 400 since they got him well but- he he like came in hot but then he had a stretch like in Rochester, he had one hit the whole series. Uh, and then he went over the first two games in Syracuse. So he had one stretch where he was basically one. Yeah, because I saw him in four. Rochester. I saw him in the Rochester series. So he yeah. didn't get on base. The but Rochester I saw, like, series in the first two games of Syracuse, he went one for 30. But you see like the Rochester oh, series, a, he had multiple three walks, three walk games. Like I saw both of those. Like he was getting on base still, and he does. He doesn't have an idea at the plate. Um, he's definitely going to be out of the forty man. I, I don't think that's a question. Well, he, they have to because it's not. It's not even a question of do you expose him. To rule he's, five. Is he a he's minor, a minor league, league free agent? Too. He's a minor league free agent, so they're going to sign. He, they're going to have to add him to the forty man within the first five days after the World Series. Yeah, but uh, he's yeah, you know, he's interesting. Um, it's bad first profile. I'm not sure how much of an impact bad it is, but I think he's going to get up to the big leagues in some capacity at some point, probably next season. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I I don't see the fit. It's kind of funny because like he's played some left field and some third base. It's not out of versatility. Like it's different well, than but no, when, but like, I, Fitzgerald does it. But right? I also think it is that if he's a bat first it's guy, the, and it's finding can, the fit. But it's also if you can fake it at like three or four positions and you're bat first, that's more useful, I think, than True. just like a second True. base fake second base only guy. Yeah, but my point is it's not like he's like good at the mall. It's like no, it's, can he it's, hack it here? It's, yeah, it's it's testing out if he's if he's, you know, serviceable enough to be if able we, to be depth there. If we hand him a left fielder's glove, will he be okay? 
Like, yeah. So yeah. no, but he's he's an interesting guy, and and I understand you know why they were attracted to him and why they were attracted to uh, Will Your Abreu in that yeah. trade with Christian Vasquez. Um, trying to pick. I, I guess I'll just throw to you anyone else in the in the Worcester lineup you want to mention, or should we jump to the pitchers? Um, I just say like the franchise was just murdering balls when I was there, which was fun to watch. And then he got called oh, up Fran- doing Franchi. that. Franchi, yeah. yeah, and uh, he's doing that again. Um, Ooh, Ronaldo Hernandez. Yeah, well, I'll get there. Let me talk about Franchi okay. for a second. Okay. Um, but I, I just just on Franchi, I think that it, it, in what we're seeing here, and it's why you don't give up on a guy like that. It like could this just be a hot streak? Probably. Like, and he'll get yeah. cold again, and you know. But the raw talent is there, and his raw tools are just absurd still. And this yeah. is why you don't give up on a guy like that. I know is as frustrating a player as he can be to watch. Just like you know, I saw him hit you know three home or two home runs in one game, and it was just like they were absolutely just annihilated. Like when you have that kind of raw power, that kind of physical ability, you just have to you know that that's the type of player that gets chance after chance, and there's a reason why. Uh, with Hernandez, he he's hitting the ball hard, and and that was that's kind of been a trend for him since pretty much the first month of the season. You know, first month of the season was three seventy seven OPS, which is obviously really bad. Since then, eight twenty eight, nine nineteen, seven eighty five, seven eighty nine, May to August, uh, month going month by month. And he yeah he 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 had some good swings, he had some bad swings. Um, I think it's just with him, it's consistency at the plate. You know, swing decisions. He still has a propensity to expand the zone, but the raw tools are there. He's got a good arm. Um. And it's just, I think that the Wong call up is actually a really good opportunity for him because I think it'll allow him to catch every day, which is honestly what he needs, in my opinion. Defense is the thing he needs to work on to be able to establish himself as a potential option for a major league team in the future. And with Wong not there now, he can get, you know, he can start four or five games a week, whereas prior he was having to split time with Wong and DHing a lot. So I, I think this will be a good opportunity for Hernandez to show what he can do. And the reason I don't think he's in the picture, though, for a call up is just that the, the defense holds him back. You know, they're not going to, given how much they're putting a priority on defense at several positions, catcher is definitely one of them. You need a good defender. And I just don't think they're comfortable with him handling the major league pitching staff at this point in his development yeah fair fair enough fair enough let's move to the arms um let's start with connor siebold because you saw him he's a guy who in our, our most recent rankings fell pretty far down i think he, he dropped more than 10 spots he's in the yeah. 20s now with siebold I, he was really bad this outing don't get me wrong he threw yeah. two-thirds of an inning gave up seven hits um i think the thing with me is just his stuff is just not it was back for a brief stretch, but there's just no consistency with it. Like in this outing, he was 89 to 91 topped out at 92, um, you know, which is like a 40 fastball. Uh, the changeup and slider were both, you know, average ish. And then he showed like a fringy curveball. But I, I think that it was kind of more like a, like a, not a reaction, but like a recalculation based on what he likely is. And I think there's just not enough consistency from outing to outing for us, for me to project him as a consistent starter at the major league level, or even as someone who I would be comfortable being like the sixth starter. And that's what he would need to be to me to be like a top, you know, 10 to 12 prospect in the system in that range. Whereas now he's down in like the twenties, which is where like Cutter Crawford was prior to his promotion. It's where like some of the other guys who were like, who I would put like a swingman type, like he mm-hmm. might, maybe mm-hmm. he can pitch his way into being a spot starter. Maybe he's more like a bullpen arm, but there's just not enough consistency and the stuff just isn't good enough for me to, to, to keep him in the top, you know, around that 10 to 12 range in the system, especially with the steps forward. A lot of the younger guys have taken this year. Mm-hmm. How about um, the bullpen? We talked about a few guys there, but that's still a pretty stacked bullpen. And, and there's a couple other guys that you mentioned that you like as potential major major leaguers there. Yeah, obviously, I, I think the best guy I saw, because um, I, ironically, Zach Kelly actually didn't throw in any of the games I was there, is is Frank uh, Frank Herman. He was 96 to 98, um, slider 85 86, change of 80, or it's, I think it's a splitter 85 to 86. I put 55s, flash, or both secondaries flashed 55 to me. Uh, fastballs, you know, easy plus fastball, probably better. Um, and the raw stuff is there. It's just about command and consistency, you know. Um, Going in from outing to outing, he's just got to be able to locate because, you know, it doesn't matter how good your stuff is. If you're not going to be able to command it, you're still going to get hit hard. But and I think that's kind of the next step is in development is just ironing out his command and getting into a level where the Red Sox are comfortable bringing up to the major leagues uh, bullpen. The other guys I liked, I liked A.G. Politi. Uh, he was 93 to 95 slider, like high 86 to 88 uh, curveball, 79 to 83. He's a, t- a notch below the rest of the like the Kelly, Bizarro, um, 
Ermon tier of relievers in that system to me or in that group to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think he's got a chance to get up to the big leagues and be like kind of like that emergency up and down guy who, you know, he gets called up, then he gets DFA'd and then he, you know, stays in the system and gets called up again, something like that. Um, and it wouldn't be surprise me if he eventually pitched his way into getting like, you know, a couple months stretch in a major league bullpen for someone. Um, Chase Ugar was another one kind of like in, in I kind of view in that same mold. Um, he's 93 to 96, change up 70, uh, excuse me, curveball 77 to 79, slider. 86 to 88 uh, change up like 89 to 90 throws a bunch of pitches a fastball in the curveball the best to me I like his curveball sliders okay change up I don't I'm not a huge fan of that but um and yeah he's similar to Politi I, I think there's enough stuff there that he might get a cup of coffee at some point with someone all right so I, I mean I think that probably winds up Worcester let's go down to Greenville because you spent the week down there like we've talked about um saw a lot of guys play a lot of games that we really wanted to get eyes on. Let's just start it. I mean, let's, we might as well just start at the top. Um, Marcelo Meyer, number one prospect prospect in the system, not elevator pitch wise. You can go into him a little bit, but like, what did you see from him? What were your takeaways? I guess, even not necessarily the scouting report, but like, what did you come away thinking? I mean, well, the first thing is, is he just looks like a baseball player. Yes. Like agreed. his, like he's got the size. I think he's listed like six, three or something. He just looks like an athlete. Um, and we're not and talking look- about the, like the, the, you know, Vince from entourage hair and eyebrows. Like it, it's like the, the, the no, he like, carries himself. It's yes. like, yes, yeah. he carries himself. Yeah. Um, but what, what I saw in the field, uh, he was actually not great. He was two for 18 with, uh, 10 strikeouts and four and four walks. We're cursed. Two plate appearances. We're so, cursed yeah, seeing it, this kid. It, it, his, his numbers is offensively. It wasn't great, but I'm not, I'm not worried. Like I saw it. Um, BP was good. You know, he's got good. He's got all fields power. It's the ball really hard. Um, in game power. He showed it too. He, he crushed, uh, I think it was a change up out to right center field. in one of the games I was there. But um, I think the thing it was off a little just was he had some timing issues in this series. He, he tended to be behind fastballs or he's out in front of, of secondary pitches. And I think that uh, that that led to the strikeouts. I also wonder if he's kind of worn down at this point in the season. Um, he's, you know, played 83 games, he's got almost 400 plate appearances this year versus, you know, he's coming off a high school season where he didn't get close to that. And then the year before probably barely played. So um, understandably, I think he's just kind of like, he's probably ready for the off season to hit pretty soon. But um, I think the biggest takeaway for me is for me is because I'm not worried about the bat. I, I mean, I've seen him hit in spring training. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. it was, I got to get out a very, really good look at him at shortstop and he was fantastic at shortstop. Um, he just glides at the position, you know, and I know he's six, three, which is on the big side for shortstops, but he moves really well. He's good athleticism. He's just very smooth. Like he makes it look easy at the position. And that was kind of one of the things I was most interested to see was him on defense. Cause in spring training, he only DH in the games I was there. I didn't take infield outfield any of the days. Mm-hmm. So um, watching him play the field was, was really impressive. He's got good range, good instincts. Uh, the arm is, you know, it's a plus arm. So I, I was very impressed with his defense. And I think that was kind of the thing that I, that I, that I took away most from him because the bat, I mean, the swing is nice. There's bat speed. Um, the approach is there just, you know, swing decisions, obviously still need some more chases a little too much still, but like, I'm not worried about the bat. And yeah, I, I, I was very impressed with him, even though his performance was like, he's one of those guys that even if he puts up a two for 18 um, performance of the plate, you still get it. And you understand why he's so highly regarded. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I saw him in Delmarva, and he was clearly hurt. Like he was swinging through ninety-one, like it was a hundred. Um, and he came out of the game, and I talked to one of the scouts who was there. He's like, "Yeah, don't worry about him. He'll be fine." <laughs> like, yeah, it's just not one you have to worry about. And I should yeah. mention too that this uh, the Greensboro pitching staff actually had like a ton of hard throwers, which was a pretty good mm. look. Well, that's good. Like I saw Jared Jones twice, who was pretty highly drafted. He was like ninety-six to ninety-eight. Another guy, another day they had a guy who was ninety-two to ninety-four. Another day they had a guy who was 95 to 97. These like, are the starters. These are saying? the starters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this doesn't include the bullpen, which they had like Eddie Yeen, who's like up to a hundred. Uh, they also had a knuckleballer in the bullpen, but yeah, you, which, you had one, which, you had one game update that you were so clearly trying I mean, not to sound pissed. It's, it's but, just hard. Cause you can't evaluate <laughs> anything when the knuckleballer is no. on the mound. And he no. threw twice in the series for like oh, four God. innings. 
So yeah. And it, the other part that was awesome though, was he was like six, three, 300 pounds. Yeah. That you sent me that photo and you're like, how hard do you think this gentleman throws? Yeah. And I like, I bit knowing that it was not going to be the answer. And I was going to be like at least 96. It's like, if you're asking me, he clearly doesn't. But then you're like, no, he's he's a knuckleballer. I was like, oh, yeah, he was, see that he, was he was like he was like 62 to 71 with his knuckleball. And then his fastball is like 90 to 91. But interesting. Um, it was just, you know, anyway. it was it is what it is. But the knuckleball, yeah. it was it was fun to watch. I mean, watching yeah. him versus Joe Davis, I don't think I'll ever see more meat at the pl- or more like. <laughs> yeah, that was like 600 pounds of man, you know, awesome. in, a, in a matchup. Love which it. Was interesting to see. Love it. Um, but, Nick uh, York. Yeah. Nick York. Uh, what is going on with Nick York? Nick, uh, not Nick. Ugh, yeah. You're Ian. yeah you're not um, I, I, I think I've been saying this. I, um, I think it's, we're kind of approaching that this season is kind of a write off for York. Um, it, it was, you know, he still will show it in flashes. Like he turned on like a 95, 96 mile per hour fastball and hit it off the wall. And it would have been a home run in any other park. Just unfortunately they have, or well, fortunately, cause it's, it looks good, but they have the, uh, they have like a green monster light out in left field there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that cost him a home run, but he did hit a home run in another game. He got a change up that he just absolutely crushed. And um, so he, he hit the ball hard, but uh, yeah, he ended up going four for 24 with three yep. walks and eight strikeouts. Um, but his bad was 200. Like, I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's a combination of a few things. I think there's some bad luck at play with him, bad luck um, kind of playing. I also think just though that the injuries have kind of sapped his timing. Um, he's, he was dead. He was kind of like Meyer. He was behind a lot of fastballs. Uh, he was late, you know, picking up secondary pitches. There were a lot of, a lot of swinging strikes, which was surprising to me because obviously he's someone who's known for his hit tool. Um, but I, I think that that is, there's definitely, I wonder if there are some lingering injuries that are bothering him still here. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, he would show it in flashes of what I saw last year. Like when I was there against Hickory and he turned on like a 99 mile per hour fastball and hit it 420 feet. But at the same time, there were definitely some swings or, you know, some, some poor swing decisions or some some weak contact that are on pitches that he wasn't swinging at last season. So I do wonder how much the injuries are still bothering him and how much just the, the, the up and down season he's kind of had where, you know, he's on for a week, then he gets hurt again, then he's off. And then, you know, that's kind of impacted his timing. Um, but yeah, you, I you mean, know, that was that. Yeah. I mean, he, even before he got hurt though, like he, he didn't have, I mean, he was pretty good the first week or so of the season. But I mean, if you start from April 26th through his first injury stint was at the end of May. So it's yeah. like that month period, like he wasn't hurt yet. And that's 219 average, 287 on base, 362 slug. I mean, he had four home runs, which was good. But, you know, 23 Ks and 115 plate appearances is not Nick York. Not that that's even that high. Um, but, you know, th- there were signs at that point. And then he gets hurt. He comes back. You know, he he's back for one game and then he's out again until June 21. And then he, he plays from June 21 through July 3rd, which is only, you know, a handful of games. That's what, 10 games. And then he's out again for another three weeks in July. Like at this point, I mean, he's finally getting consistent playing time, but at the same time, it's just, yeah, it's a weird season for him. I think that's a good way to put um, it. Um, but I, I do think like Brian Abraham, again, going back to that great article today with, from Chad Jennings and the athletic, he talked about it with York too. And he said, like, he basically was like, yeah, he's, we're seeing a guy that's not a hundred percent for a lot of this year. Um, and I, I do agree that like his at bats were like, he, he was putting together some good at bats. Like he's working counts. He was taking, you know, he'd have an at bat where, you know, he worked like a nine pitch at bat, but then unfortunately like, you know, line out to right field or something. So I do think there's, as I said, right. some bad at luck there, but right. it also, there was a little bit of like, um, a little over aggressiveness at times or kind of expanding the zone, but on defense he was better than I saw last year, um, which I was encouraging. Um, I do think he can stick at second base now. I don't think he's going to need to move to left field. Mm-hmm. Um, it's never going to be great there, but you know, I think he, he's going to get to like 45. Yeah. He'll get to 45 ish. Maybe even he can get to 50 if he can keep his body in, in check. So I, I just think that, yeah, like given what he did last year, obviously the expectations were high, but he's not someone I would write off or really worry about heading into next season. Um, I think he's going to write the ship then. Mm-hmm. We've got to appease the internet and ask about Blaze Jordan. Um, Blaze Jordan. Yeah, he, he was, I, I, he's been much better in Greenville than I, than he has in Salem, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if the numbers show that out, uh, like the, I'll pull it up. The, you talk the, the lines, but I was, I was impressed. Um, 
with some of the stuff he was doing. Like he hits the ball. The first thing is he hits the ball extremely hard. Um, uh, oh, got it. So his numbers in Greenville are much better. Um, granted, yeah. in Salem, in Salem, he had a slow start. So I'll pull up where, where after he got good in Salem, but in Greenville, it's a 349 average, 449 on base, 500 slugging for a 959 OPS, whereas he only had an 803 OPS in Salem. But like I said, I think he had a slow start. So I'll pull up that, that split yeah, once he started hitting. He, he's hitting the ball. He hit the ball really hard um, when he made contact. He, he was 7 for 23 when I was there, so 304, 429, 304. And... Um, he only hits, it was all singles though. Uh, there was no extra base hits, but Ooh. there were definitely some encouraging signs. Like I saw him turn on the 95, 96 mile per hour fastball and, and line it for a single to left field. Um, that was something he really struggled with in Salem this year. It was turning on velocity, but since he's gone up to Greenville, his OPS against Velo has really increased. Definitely encouraging. Um, he put some pretty good swings on breaking balls too. He seems very comfortable hitting breaking balls in the zone. He still has a he's propensity. Good. Spin and off speed generally. It seems like he's been comfortable. Yeah, against all he, he, he seems more comfortable against breaking balls than changeups. But he he definitely has, he will expand against them. But when they're in the zone, he does a pretty good job of hitting them, and he can hit them pretty hard. Um, so that was encouraging. He he was uh he, as I said like. He, he put together some like decent at bats, like his four walks. There were a couple of competitive ones in there. There were a couple that were nothing you can do. Like when it's four pitches that aren't close, you know, obviously you're, you're going to take the walk there, mm -hmm. but um, overall, like I, I, I do, I do. I'm intrigued by him. He's a very unique prospect. You don't see a lot of like high school bats like him that are pretty much maxed out physically that um they obviously and bp is bp is insane like his raw power is it's 70 raw like he can just crush mm -hmm. the ball mm -hmm. i'm just not I'm, I'm interested to see how much especially when he gets up to double a how it translates in game because i do wonder if he's gonna have to sacrifice some some power to for contact but overall i i was encouraged by what i saw especially given the reports i got coming out of salem which definitely raised some red flags about things like you know as i said like his ability to pull the ball against velocity velo up in the zone things like that um, I think there's still areas he needs to work on. I do think he needs to um, improve his approach. I think it's better. It's definitely improved this year. And I think facing more consistent, better breaking balls is something he needs for his development, which is why I'm interested to see him in double A. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, overall, like he was good. Um, it will just, it's just a tough profile because of the defense. Like he's, he's a first baseman to me. Uh, I think he's got enough arm for third base. But it's the just actions not very, are, yeah, it's not very fluid yeah. over there. Um, at first base, though, I was impressed. He, his, he, he had some really nice plays on balls in the dirt. Um, he showed soft hands mm. over there. So, it, you know, I think he could be actually a decent defensive first baseman, especially, you know, with if he's serving as a cutoff man or something, he's got a good arm. But um, yeah, overall, you know, I, 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 it was, it was a solid, a solid first impression or first, like, you know, extensive look at him. And uh, I, I was impressed, especially when you consider, you know, he's a, what is he 19 or 20? I think he's 20 now. No, no yeah, he's still 19. Still no, 19 he's still 19. Right? So he's still 19, you know, facing guys, you know, college guys or guys, 22, 23 years old, who are throwing in the high nineties. I thought he, I thought he held himself. Uh, he uh, held his own and did a, did a very good job. So it was definitely encouraging um, from him. Um, just the, the thing on, on Jordan, he wasn't great in April in Salem. He wasn't great in July in Salem, but in May and June, um, I mean, his June, he had a 1.14 OPS 404 average 660 slugging. Um, so he got super hot in May and June and then cooled off a little bit before he got the promotion. So that's what yeah. I was thinking of. Yeah. It's just with him. I think it's going to be, he just needs to, it's the approach is going to, is the still the thing that he needs to work yep. on. It's you improve that approach because he, when he, when the ball's in the zone and it's a pitch he can hit, he can hit a really far and really hard. It's just, he's still too often to me is chasing these pitches that, you know, he's chasing a breaking ball foot outside or, you know, he's chasing a fastball, you know, in the dirt that he shouldn't be swinging at. And when he's laying off those and waiting for pitchers to come in the zone, he's going to be able to do damage. A quick, let's do just some quick hitters for the rest of the lineup. So then we can go to some of the pitchers and then go to emails um, really quick. So just we'll hit on them. Uh, Matthew Lugo. We talked about him at third base, but at the plate. Um, yeah, he's, he's an interesting player. I, he is similar to Jordan where he can, he can, when he makes contact or when he's swinging at strikes, he hits the ball really hard and he can hit the ball pretty far. But um, he just has some very poor at bats too, where he just, you know, the uncompetitive at bats where he goes in, chases, you know, three bad pitches off the plate and ends up rolling over. And it, it wasn't really strong slowing up 
excuse me, showing up in the strikeout rate. He only struck out twice, actually, in the games I was there. He was 12 for 28 with a home run and a double and then 10 singles. Um, one walk, two strikeouts, because he's pretty aggressive, but and he makes he, he made a lot of contact in this game, but it was uh that contact is sometimes he basically is sacrificing, you know, to, in order to make contact, he's sacrificing it being quality contact. And I think that's the thing he needs to focus on is again, it's the approach. It's not chasing bad pitches out of the zone. And I think unlike Jordan, who will just had what was tending to swing and miss in those, which in this case is actually obviously beneficial because it gives him a chance to get a pitch. He can actually hit Lugo has enough good enough hand eye and bat control that he makes contact with those. And the end result is a lot of like weak, you know, pop-ups to the infield or ground balls to the pitcher, their second baseman. And that was, that was something that tended to happen a lot. But at the same time, when you make contact, you can hit the ball really hard. I have a video I'll put out probably by the time this comes out of a swing of his that ended up in a line drive and you'll see like there's bat speed and he can you know when he makes contact squarely he hits the ball really super hard mm-hmm. but um yeah we just need to prove the consistency and the quality of contact with him but he's an interesting player um and again i i'm, I'm very interested to see how he looks against double a pitching i think that's going to be a good like separator for him and kind of give us a better idea of what he is in the future guy that i really liked in salem nathan hickey uh hickey was probably the most he was he best results show. based week. Well, no, Lugo probably oh. has that because he had twelve. Okay. He he was twelve for twenty eight. Um, Ooh, okay, Hickey yeah. probably just showed Hickey showed the most power or the most ability to impact the baseball just because he had three home runs out of his four hits. <laughs> um, right, he also had five. Right. He he got a good approach though of of those guys. He makes the best swing decisions. He had five walks and sixteen or in ten sixteen plate appearances. Um, and he he does a good job not expanding. He's got some in zone swing and miss. He definitely had some trouble with some velo up. Um, but he also turned on like a ninety seven mile per hour fastball and hit it out or 96 mile per hour fastball so uh, he he can do both um there's in zone swing and miss but he also can hit the ball really hard when he connects and i think that 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 was impressive was just yeah his ability to impact the baseball like when he he's got legit power it's plus raw power i would say um it's just with him it's just where does the hit tool go you know how much how high is the hit tool going to go for that power to actualize and where does the defense get to because yeah, defensively ask about what you thought about his defense. defensively his receiving is okay. Um, it's not not great. It's never going to be great. The issue for me is his throwing. Um, mm-hmm. His pops were like two one to two two mm-hmm. in that range, and which it's tell just people not a, what what that grades out to is average. So yep. it's you know that's like a 35, 40 arm, mm-hmm. um, or thirty five forty part pop time at least. But the, yeah, as a, yeah, as a measure like of the, arm. the arm yeah. is not very strong. Um, it's a slow release, and then it takes a while to get there because it doesn't have much carry. And they were running a lot on him, and that's something that I'm just slightly concerned of as he. You know, especially against better base runners, might be able to be exposed in that area. But I thought the receiving was 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 okay enough. So it'll be interesting to see if his arm, if he can take a step forward with that arm, um, you know, add some arm strength over the offseason, maybe. But I was impressed with him at the plate. I liked his swing decisions. I liked his ability to impact the baseball. I liked his batting practice. He, had a, he you know, showed all fields power and showed it in game two. Like he hit one over the monster, then he hit one out off over the right field towards the scoreboard. So mm-hmm. he, uh, he, he was pretty impressive. Um, and I, I think there might even, you know, it's going to depend on the hit tool. Um, you know, I know I've talked to some scouts who, who think it's, you know, more like a 30, 30, 35 hit tool versus potentially a 40 or 45. But if he can get to that 40, 45 range and, you know, be a fringy catcher, then that's definitely a potential big leaguer in my opinion. Mm-hmm. All right. Give me like, two to three sentences on the following guys, Tyler McDonough. Uh, great defense uh, hits the ball really hard when he makes contact needs to cut down on the swing and miss, but I, I I'm a Tyler McDonough fan. I, I think that he will get to the big leagues in some capacity. Nice. Uh, Gilberto Jimenez. Uh, not the best look. He got thrown out of one of the games I was there and he just, he didn't play very much. I think he only played two of the games. I want to say um, it seems like he's firmly entrenched as kind of a backup now. Um, yeah, he paid, he played two games, so he was going to start three, um, could have, could have related to the, to the ejection too, though. So we don't know. Well, no, cause he played, we don't know either game. way. Oh, he played the next well, game. He, oh, okay. he played the next day. He played oh, the okay. next never two mind days. Then. So never yeah. Mind then. Um, the, the ejection also, he was definitely safe. Uh, yeah. it was like a bang, bang play at first base we got like, but he can still run. It was like three, nine on a bunt, mm-hmm. but, uh, he, he just hasn't he still hasn't progressed at the plate. Um, the swing decisions are still poor. There's it's still just kind of him going up there and throwing his hands to the ball and trying to run. Um, there's just a very limited ability to impact the baseball defensively. He looked pretty good actually in center field. Um, 
there are some inconsistent reads, but he can make up for it with his speed. The arm is good. It's it like flash 60, but there were also some like 40 throws in there, but he showed a 60 arm, which was encouraging. So I, I you know, he's one of those guys that you, you have to, you have to give him a chance just because of how good an athlete he is. But um, the clock's ticking there. Like he, he's, he's got a, I think he needs a pretty significant swing overhaul for him to ever um, develop into, you know, or kind of reach his raw talent or in the ability that he should have given that raw talent. That was Two very two or three very long sentences. Um, Max Ferguson and Corey Rozier, the two new guys. Uh, both of them, they're you know they're interesting. Uh, Ferguson, I, I liked a little more. He's got good position versatility. I saw him play second, short, center field. Uh, good approach at the plate. Um, you know, really understands the strike zone. Takes a walk. He's got good speed. Just he needs to add strength. He's he he he'll like square a ball up and it'll be a line drive to right field just because he doesn't have enough strength. So that's the area of this game I think he needs to focus on the most is just getting stronger. Uh, Rozier is um, a little smaller, uh, but he's a you know twitchy athlete. Um, he can really run uh, decent defense. Just, um, yeah, just he needs to improve consistency at the plate for me. Big Joe Davis. Got to close with Big Joe. Uh, fan favorite. <laughs> Future mayor of Greenville, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 he's fun. He's just fun. It's what it's things like that that make minor league baseball fun beyond the talent mm-hmm. on the field is like, you know, the connection between someone like him and the fans is really fun to watch. And do they, do they put big Joe Davis on the scoreboard? Oh yeah. They announced big, big Joe whenever big he comes Joe. to the plate. Nice. Yeah. Love it. Um, all right. Pitching side. Let's talk about Wickelman Gonzalez. Seems like you, you got a better look at him than I did. I feel like he has made improvements throughout the year when I've watched him. It looks like the mechanics are quieter than when I saw him. Um, interested in what you thought and, and, you know, did he hold V low, that kind of thing? Yeah, he, he was, uh, I actually, I was much more impressed than I was when I saw him in spring training. Um, he was, uh, he came out, he was 95 to 97. He settled in at like 94 to 95, um, mixing them both a four seam and a two seam, uh, change up 86 to 89 and a curveball. I think it's a curveball at 77 and 980. I don't know it, it, what they would call it, but it looked very curveballish for the most of the outing. And then actually, as the outing went on, it kind of flipped and more looked like a slurve. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think the delivery has gotten better as the season go, had, has gone on. Um, he looks a little more athletic out there, and I, I think his ability to hold command and control is going to be better with this delivery, and I think the results have shown that. Um, I think he had another good start last – when would we pitch last night maybe? Um, he actually – he's going to be our pitcher of the month for August. Oh, really? Well, yeah, because yeah, since he got promoted, uh, 12 innings, 19 strikeouts, five walks, um, only four in runs. And um, – yeah, I, I I think that uh, he was getting a lot of he had got eleven swing and misses in, in four innings. Um, with him, it's just he's got to improve the consistency on the mound with his pitches. Um, the changeup he really didn't have good feel for early, and then as the game went on, he developed it. Um, but things like that, you know, it's tough to go through the first three innings of a game with only two pitches. Yeah, and then finally find your changeup in the fourth inning. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But. I, I still like I I, I understand I, I I don't think he he's done quite what people expected given you know kind of like the pedigree or what they were hearing about him but I actually think he's had a pretty solid overall season same I'm not I'm not sure he's a starter long term he might be like a but I think he could be an impact reliever if he doesn't have the bullpen and I'm not closing the door on him as a starter um he still is tough to hit he throws hard he's got three pitches that will flash at least average and you can go above on them. Like there's a mm-hmm. lot to like still here, still there. Um, it's just as, as he continues to clean up his mechanics and improve the command and control, those are the things we need to see. I, I found myself, I think Ian initially disappointed in him that he wasn't like, I don't want to say Anderson Espinosa, but like Mata or Bayo or like, but then like, he's kind of had this, like for me, at least this, like, you know, inverse bell curve type season of my, my esteem of him and that like, okay, but for Wickelman Gonzalez, he is having a good developmental year and it's interesting stuff. And it's a major league arm. Right. Yeah. I also don't think like, like Bayo, I think that's a weird, like an interesting comparison. Bayo's not, as soon as I said well, it, I didn't. Cause Bayo it. wasn't good in the low minors. No, he like was, he was wise. bad in Greenville. So I like, yeah. maybe think Mata is probably the Name I'm like, thinking like Bayo, Bayo, and Bayo in Greenville. Uh, obviously, it was it was a cross. Yeah, Bayo was world. he was he had a, he had a good end of the year. If you looked at his monthly splits, I think he was better. Yeah. The well, I guess he year. was also in Greenville in 19 when it was actually Greenville uh, when it was low A Greenville, but like he had like a five four ERA. Well, that's there. what I meant. Yeah, that's yeah. What I, that's what I was saying was low A. But like yeah, like Mata or like even maybe like a Darwin's in 
or, you know, when he was in the low minors of like guy who there's buzz about goes to low a pitches really well. We push him into the top 10. Rickleman yeah, didn't mean, really make that push the way I had hoped he would, but it's like for him, he's having a very good year. He will probably end the year in our top 15. Yeah. I, I like, actually, I, I think I, I would have him higher than where we have him. Yeah. Um, and I'd probably be prepared to move him up a little bit with a nut with more like continuing to show this. But yeah, right? I, I just was encouraged because in spring training, he was, he, the delivery was really rough. His body didn't look, he didn't look in the best physical condition and the stuff was down like cons- pretty, he was like nine pitching the low, low to mid nineties. It was just nice to see him back and, you know, the mid nineties consistently holding that right. below for four and he's only through like 75 ish pitches. But um, yeah, I, 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 I was pretty impressed. And you got to remember he's 20 years old pitching in high A. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's a pretty good developmental outcome if that he's sure. you know, made it up to high A and pitching well there. And I, I think overall, this has been a positive season for him. I think if he does end up lower in the rankings, then at the beginning of the season, it's more because other guys have taken that big step forward. Yeah. And I, added, I know one guy you they, have in they, mind. <laughs> they've added talent to the system. Yeah. He's at 15 right now. Um, yeah. And we had him ranked between 14 and 17. So I think we're all more or less on the same page as far as he goes, but like, I could see Perales passing him, right? Like I could see maybe blaze. Yeah. I mean, up I've, of him. Yeah, like, I've, I've already done that. <laughs> you have, you are on an yeah. Island for that, but I get it, but I also, yeah. Like, it. but I think I like, I could see myself, especially I, I need, I want, I want to see Chris Murphy again this year. I've already seen him twice, but I want to see him a third time. Now that he's in triple a, but I could see like talking myself into taking those low minors guys over someone like Chris Murphy. If I think, I don't, I'm not sure he's a starter. And I think he kind of like is more like that fringy bull. He's arm, losing like the control like again. That. He's losing yeah. the control. He's starting like to I, walk guys again. Like yeah. that's just an example of someone where it's like, I would rather take, I think a chance on the upside of someone like Gonzalez or Perales. Yep. Yep. Fair. Um, you liked Tyber, Tyler Ruberstein. Um, I did. Yeah. He was someone I saw back in spring training and maybe then, a little uh, more he, abridged version, but yeah. Yeah. He came off the, he came off the IL and I think he went right back. Went on right back actually. on. Yeah. Cause I remember, um, cause I was asking you the other day, like, did you see anything? And it's like, well, they made a, there was a weird mound visit. That didn't make any then, sense, but I figured it was a pitch count thing, and it made perfect sense. But yeah, it wasn't a leg issue, right? A quad, I want to yeah, say, which or makes something. sense. Yeah, because they, yeah, with so there were there was no one on and two outs in the fourth inning, and they went out to the mound, and then he retired the next guy, and then he just didn't come back for the fifth inning. And I just assumed it was a pitch count thing because he was at like seventy something. But uh, looking, it definitely could have been. Maybe they saw something with his mechanics, and that's why they went out there. But um, yeah. Anyway, he he was he he's an interesting guy, just in the sense that. He, he's one of those like kind of like a driveline pitcher. He he's really focuses on like the pitch shapes and the, 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 the processes mm-hmm. behind everything. And uh, was, like low nineties, fastball, good movement, throw two seam or two uh, sliders, like low eighties, 80 to 82 uh, change up 84 to 86. I like the change up better than the slider. I put it at 55 on the change up. I went like average ish on the other pitches, but um, I think he's kind of like the sum of all parts where, you know, if you have three average pitches and, you know, a potential for average command, you can get up to the big leagues in that role, either as like a depth starter or maybe even, you know, you, you can get into the back end type. But um, yeah, he, he's an interesting guy. And, and I think that he, uh, he's, he definitely belongs in like that top 40 range to me. Yep. Um, other pitchers you want to mention? I mean, maybe just a quick one on Wyatt Olds because I thought you had some interesting stuff to say about him. He's had a weird year. He's had a ton of walks. He's hit a ton of guys. And you're so, talking about him internally, I think, was really interesting. Yeah, I, I Olds, um, he threw, t- threw t- two good games. And I, I think that something, and, I, and I'm wondering how much of this is the hit by pitches and the walks and everything is driven by, he's definitely forcing his change up in there. Uh, his change up is not very good at all. Um, I, I, his fastball and slider are both good to me. The change up is not, um, at one point he threw it first pitch to like five consecutive batters. And I think half of them went to the backstop and one of them hit someone. And I, I think that, the, that, that with him, you can't really read the number, take the numbers at face value, because I genuinely think that they're, he's basically being told you have to throw this many changes per game and, you know, he'll throw like one or two good ones, but then the rest of them are just really bad and it can lead to some poor results. And I think that's kind of what's driven his really poor statistical season because the raw stuff is good. Like fastballs up to 90, 97, 98 miles an hour, sits more in the mid 90s. Um, and this is as a starter sliders, 80, you know, 86 to 88 with some good shape. He can really, you know, snap it off and kind of bury it down and away from guys gets whiffs with both those pitches. Um, but like I saw him twice and I don't think, let me check. Actually, I'm interested now to see. Well, um, if I can just jump in the, the hip, the HBPs, he's hit 26 guys this year. Next is Jose Ramirez of all people who's hit 18 and half as many at bat, batter's face, which is kind of crazy. And then next is Wickelman Gonzalez with 11. Yeah. 
Um, so. He's literally hit a lot of guys, but uh, yeah, like his change, like his fastball and slider, he can go get whiffs with them. Like he got one whiff with a change up and two starts this week. And so that's the thing that he's definitely trying to work on. Um, he, if he can find consistently consistency with that pitch, that's his chance to be more of like a long reliever. Even maybe they they continue to develop as a starter. I think personally, given his delivery and the two pitch arsenal we'll he possesses, yeah. he's a reliever long term. But we I, both I said that in spring training. I'm with you. On I, that. I still think there's a shot at a major league reliever, which is why he's someone I would have in my top sixty still. Yep. Yeah. He's like he's he's right around there. He might if he's not in the top sixty, he's like just outside of it right now. And that's just yeah. that's just fluctuations in that area. And I think especially you know, guys falling in and out and being in that area at this point of the year, don't worry too much about, I think at the end of the year, that's when we really sit down and think really, really hard about all of these guys. And it might mean a little bit more, but I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, he's someone I I would have inside that group. And then um, just kind of like, Going quickly through the rest of the, some of the, some of the other the only other starter I think um, that is worth let me make sure yeah the other starter I I, I think is worth mentioning is uh, Chi Jung Liu. Um, and Olds is sixty. On, hold on, let me just jump in. Olds is sixty one right now. Like yeah, so he's right there. Okay, um, Chi Jung Liu. Yeah, he's yeah. What's he, up with him? It's tough. He uh, like his stuff will show flash. It's just not a lot of consistency and mm-hmm. um. Yeah, he's he's fastball is like ninety three to ninety five, but it's it's pretty straight and got gets hit hard when it's in the zone. Um, sliders like eighty three, eighty four to eighty seven. Curveball seventy eight to ninety. It's seventy eight to eighty. Change up eighty one, eighty two. Um, it's just it, it's just a pretty fringy arsenal. Um, he was actually good in the start. I, I think he lasts like all he, into the sixth inning. Um, but yeah, I I think the slider has the potential to miss some bats. But other than that, um. I think it's just a very fringy profile. And I think that's part of why he he's had such an inconsistent year. Um, he's very, he's pretty small too. Like it's not a yeah. starter's build. Yeah. He's probably like five eleven, six foot. He's pretty skinny. So um, yeah, it, it's been a rough year for him. I, 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 you know, obviously you don't want to count someone off who who's, who's shown in the past fastballs up into the high nineties, but it mm-hmm. just at this point in right now, he's not, he's not showing that type of raw stuff. Well, Penn, tell me about Luis Guerrero, because this was a guy I was really interested in having you see and reporting back on what the deal is there, because he's a guy who I don't think anyone listening is really thinking much about. He entered the rankings this month at 57. I, I have him at 47, which is probably too high, but we both have him roughly in the same area, and I think it's just I could see him continuing to move up. Yeah, Guerrero was kind of like, I feel like every year when I go on these trips, there's a pop up pitcher. And uh, for me this year, it was Guerrero. And he is someone who, who it's a very cool story. Like he's a he was a 17th round pick last year out of Chipola Junior College signed for 122,000. Uh, he's 22 years old. So he's not he's still on the young side for a college guy. I guess he was a Juco guy. Um, and he started the year in the FCL and he's made it all the way up to Greenville. And he's 98 to 100 with his fastball uh, or 90, 95 to hundred, we'll say um, sits like, you know, 96, 98 uh, fastball is very straight below average command. So we need to, that's the area that he's definitely got to improve upon, but he'll throw a split. He's got a nasty splitter. It's like 83 to 85 miles an hour. And it's spin rate is extremely low. Um, Like, yeah, it it's lower than the knuckleball, for example. And so that pitch is just really is a very impressive pitch. Like, and there's just not, there's not a lot of consistency with it. Like I saw him twice in one outing. It was pretty poor. And the other it flash, you know, 60 to 65. So he's got to improve his consistency, but the raw stuff and ingredients are exactly what you look for. in like a power bullpen arm, you know, high nineties, fastball, power breaking ball, good splitter. Um, there's just a lot to like there. And I think it's just, you know, he's missing a ton of bats this year. It's just about finding consistency with his delivery and mechanics that allow him to get to his, um, command with his fastball and consistency with his secondary pitches. Cause he's a good athlete. So I, I, he's mm-hmm. someone I, I think is worth definitely monitoring in, uh, in as kind of like a future bullpen piece. Mm-hmm. Anyone else on the, in the pitching staff? Maybe Zephyr John who got promoted. I know you, you had, so Zephyr John is a former third round guy who's now already in the bullpen. He was a third round in 19, I believe. Yeah. Um, out of Kansas. Yeah. He's someone I would not be surprised at all if he made the big leagues in some capacity. Uh, he's like mid nineties, fastball, 95, to 97 slider, 85 to 87 curveball, 76 to 78. Also throws change up eight low eighties. Um, I think he's got to par down the, the, the pitch mix. He doesn't need four pitches as a reliever. 
But um, yeah, yeah, he 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 can he showed the ability to miss bats with his fastball up in the zone. He's got some good carry on it. Um, just about you know honing in command again. But I, I think the raw stuff is pretty interesting for him now that he's found kind of a home in the bullpen. Um, and his numbers also have been very good since he moved into like a pure bullpen role from out of like a piggyback starter thing. Yeah, he's kind of um, bounced back and forth all year. It's been weird. Like they've needed him to start at times, and yeah. It's been interesting. Yeah, because like now he's um as a pure reliever, like I think it's his last, I don't know, five or six appearances. Um yeah, he is uh sorry, just trying to bring it up. His last seven innings, four hits, no walks, nine strikeouts. So hmm. um yeah, swinging strike rate of 16% too. So yeah. he's uh he's been pretty impressive in like a pure relief role. Um, other guys I'll just quickly like Jacob Webb. He's he's big body, fa- good fastballs, like mid mid to high nineties fastball, decent slider. Just he's a little erratic. Just got improved consistency there. Um, Brendan Salucci is the same thing, and he's worth mentioning just because he comes out to wild thing, which I think is just perfect. Um, which one, the original one or the, the one the that's one in major for, league? The one for major league. Okay, by X. Um, nice. Maybe he's a John yeah, Moxley fan. Um, I don't know who that is. Don't worry um, about it. Dane Ambrose, but. Uh, I don't know who that is, but, um, anyway, yeah, go ahead. Uh, but he, he actually was really, I think he struck out like seven of the eight guys he saw in the two games. I saw him pitch. Um, I'm just trying to bring it up now, but, um, he's got a ton of strikeouts this year. It's like 76 and 58 innings, but he's also got 43 walks and, um, it's a really kind of a stiff delivery, but it's also deceptive as a result of that. Um, the stuff is actually down from what I, from what I've seen in the past from him, he's, his fastball is like 90 to 92 now, but, um, he gets whiffs on it because his delivery is just, there's a lot of funk in his delivery. And he actually pitched three times when I was there, excuse me. And he, uh, he threw three and two thirds innings with nine strikeouts, no hits, one walk. So, um, that was, that was obviously pretty impressive, but yeah, 90, 92, here was like a short slider and a change up, um, and a curveball too. Um, fastball breaking balls, the, 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 the combo he's left-handed. So you got to keep him alive, but I just think that I'm just so concerned enough about the command that I'm not yeah. sure it'll ever reach a level for him to be able to pitch like in the high minor or not, not pitch in the high minors, but like get reached the big leagues with that type of command profile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Um, good crew. Anyone looking at the roster, I'm reminded of one transaction today was the activation of Aaron Perry who has not pitched at all this year, was assigned to Greenville. Potential live arm just has had a lot of injuries. Um, he hadn't pitched since July 7th, 2021, uh, doing an undisclosed injury. And before he, he missed the 2018 season after Tommy John. So uh, good to have him back. Interested to see what we see out of him. But I just noticed that looking at the uh, Greenville roster. Um, a lot of stuff in there, Ian. First of all, thank you for going to all those games. Uh, for go- doing that travel. We appreciate it. I'm sure the fans appreciate it. Um, good info. If you have questions about anything we talked about, any of these guys, hit us up at podcast at socksprospects.com. And I think with that, let's transition into emails. Our, f- our first email comes from Ryan, who says, Hey guys, first time emailer. Um, how does the promotion out of the, how does promoting players out of the DSL work? Do they go to the FCL team or are they sometimes sent straight to Salem based on how advanced they are? Never really paid much attention to that far down in the system before, so thought I'd ask. Um, almost always to the Florida Complex League. When when Lowell was a thing, you would see guys go straight to Lowell sometimes if they were advanced. Um, very rarely do you see someone go straight to Salem, especially now. Um, but yeah, in-season promotions are extremely rare because now you're talking about things like getting visas. Um, which kind of complicate things does happen with top guys sometimes, but uh, very rare, but yeah, usually the guys will come up for whatever fall program the the Red Sox have. So for example, you know, this year looking at it, you know, names that I would expect to see on a roster for that would be like Frilly Encarnacion, uh, Marvin Alcantara, probably Framie De Leon, just because he's a big bonus guy, Armando Sierra, those are, you know, for infielders and the outfield guys like Kelvin Diaz, Nathaniel Uton, um, Yosandra Asensio uh, on the mound, guys like Willen Carmenar, Colmenares, Luis Cohen, Cristian Nunez, uh, Dennis uh, Regulo, Regillo, sorry, uh, Iberson Polanco. I'm sure there'll be guys that we are surprised by as well. 
but um, you'll see those guys come up and other guys who, if they're, if they're healthy, will come up too. But um, yeah, that's how that works. Uh, but thanks for the question. Sometimes the simplest ones are the good ones to ask because other people might have the same ones. Um, next question is Sam. Uh, you'll like this one, Ian. Uh, he says, hi guys, fantastic work as always these past few months. Um, my EPL club was bought by the Saudis last year and became the richest club in the world. Uh, who is that, Ian? I'm sure you know. A Newcastle. Newca- okay. Oh, yeah, he does say it in here. Um, yeah, he says, he says, thanks, Sam from Newcastle, who was furious. You'd think I'm a Sunderland fan. <laughs> um, oh, I remember. Yeah, that was fair. Yeah. I, I yeah. thought I, you're one of the two if you live on the Tyne. So, yeah, okay. I mean, makes sense. He's a Newcastle fan. All right. But he he was asking, relatedly, I was wondering why we don't see more more investment from abroad into Major League Baseball, which is a fair question. I think the reason is that, and I don't know enough about um, international football to know how the sale of teams works. Yeah. Um, in MLB, you have to be approved by the Major League Baseball owners. Like John, yeah, Han- you know, I- John Henry can't up and sell to whomever he wants. Yeah, I don't think that's I I believe how it works is you have to be approved by the league. You have to pass like a fit and true test or some basically proving you have money and you're not going to run a club into the ground. Yeah, but I don't believe the other owners have like a vote to say whether you can take over a team or not. Oh, sure, sure. By the way, I I meant I I should have said the league and not the owners, but it's like, yeah, you have to be approved, though. So like, but no, in in, in the MLB, you have to vote the owners vote, don't they? Oh, the oh, you're saying internationally. Internationally, they do not do that. No, the I know owners, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, I thought you were talking about MLB. Okay, no. So know. there's you. You have to be approved by MLB. I don't know if it's a committee or all thirty owners or what, but like, if a team, if some like international oil baron were going to try and buy a team in MLB, they probably wouldn't let him because they'd be afraid he would just spend five hundred million on payroll and just make a mockery of the CBP. I, I also think though that the the biggest thing is that unlike like soccer is a global sport, um, yep. people all over the world are obviously very invested in the Premier True. League. Like, True. Whereas I don't think baseball has as much uh, like appeal to certain parts of the world. Um, sure, but it's like the Yankees are going to get. Sold. It's big in part of Asia's obviously, but yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's, I think though, that if you look like there are very few American sports, it's not just baseball, like yeah. very few of them are owned by, I don't think I even the even, NFL, I, mean, like, I can't I think of a single one of an NBA or an NFL team that's owned by a foreign investor primarily. Yeah. So I do wonder too, if there's something like there's just more like government regulation when it comes to like big sure. ownership stakes like that. I don't sure. know, something like that. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I think that just the, the the dynamic of soccer and its appeal or football and its appeal to the global markets is the big reason why a lot of those foreign investors go for like the big EPL teams. And I think it's why you're seeing a lot of American owners are investing in obviously soccer yep. teams like, oh, yeah. um, like obviously John Henry and FSG are heavily invested or they're, they're the owners of Liverpool. Manchester United is owned by the Glazers who also own the Buccaneers. Um, well, don't the cons own a team? Uh, yeah, they own Fulham, Fulham um, okay. and they own the Jags also. Stan Kroenke, who owns the Rams, I want to say. The Rams, the Avalanche, the Nuggets, owns Arsenal. Uh, the guy who owns the Dodgers, Todd Bowley, just bought, or is the, you know, the primary owner of the Dodgers just bought Chelsea. I mean, hell, so, Ryan Reynolds and um, oh, yeah. I always forget the guy from It's Always Sunny. Rob, uh, um, Rob McKierney, Ma- McKierney, thank you, McKierney, McKierney, yeah. McKierney, bought Wrexham, which is like, what are they like? Yeah, that show is actually pretty good. It's on FX. five it's, or something. Uh, yeah, they're in the they're in the champion or they're in the conference north or whatever it's called. Okay, the, the, yeah, it's the all fifth the way division. down. That's all. Well, the way they, down. They, yeah, no, well, no, not all the way down. That's oh, it's like, not okay. No, oh, it's uh, the there's first, eight, it's, right? No, there's like tw- there's like twenty different. Oh, are there? The, okay. There's there's four football leagues. Like set up. There's four football league leagues: Premier League, Championship, Championship. First Division, Second Division, or League One, League Two. Then the fifth division is like the Conference League, and that's what they're in. So they're one step away. They they lost in the playoffs last year to move up to the Football League. Gotcha. Um, but no, but it. it, I I uh I actually had a point. I just can't remember what it was now. Um, Sorry. You said the show was good. Maybe that was the point. No, no, it was something to do with. It was something to do with uh. Oh, what I was going to say was actually there are a lot of baseball people, though, getting involved with um, with soccer right now. Like Billy Bean is like involved oh, yeah. with, an, with an ownership group. Well, Jeff he was involved with the, the what is it? Red ball or whatever. That's like, a, yeah, um, I forget. It's the like, name a, it's like it. an investment group know. or something, but it's uh, like an investment but, but, group that you get involved in and it goes and buys something. And like blows Jeff, Jeff Lunau just bought a team. 
um, the the ex Astros guy. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and like obviously, so there's 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 a lot of uh, it's a it's a it's a valid question, but I I and I, we don't know the exact answer, but I'm guessing it's a lot of it is to do with just with the global appeal. There's they just don't see the return on investment in baseball probably. Mm-hmm. Next question is from Devin. He says, I feel like there's a lot of love amongst fans for Blaze Jordan because of his pedigree and huge batting practice raw power. However, on the pod, you mentioned a struggle with velocity due to his underwhelming bat speed. You know, Saris on The Athletic recently highlighted how Cards prospect Lars Nuthbar um, increased his bat speed through work with driveline. Curious from your experience if there are historical comps for guys in the sock system or elsewhere who successfully beat the charges of a slow bat. Seems like a difficult trait to develop, but curious on your takes. Thanks, Devin. Um, nothing comes to mind for me, but that's also not something we've had a ton of insight in for a, a whole long time either. Um, yeah, I, I think come to mind I, I think I think that that is kind of like what he's talking about with the drive line and everything is kind of a recent development in baseball. Yeah. I think there's a lot more focus on like things Pitching. like measurables, like bat speed, and you see it more with pitchers, as you said. Yep. But um, I think there's definitely been a turn towards position players trying to figure stuff out like that. Um, I think though, like someone like Jaron Duran made the swing changes that um, that like you see a lot, you hear a lot more about swing changes. I think than you do than guys purely going for bat speed. But I could see um, I think as kind of we progress over the next couple of years, that's definitely something we'll hear more about. Next question is from Adam. He says, the general consensus seems to be that Eric Hosmer is keeping first base warm until Tristan Casas is ready. But if Hosmer can provide professional first base play at league minimum over the next few seasons, does that make Casas available in the, as the centerpiece of a trade? This could create a bridge to Nico Cavadas or looking further in the future, plays Jordan or a position change for another player. Not saying I want to trade Casas, but trying to think like a GM. Thanks, Adam. I think it's far more likely that Hosmer would get, would get, would get traded when Casas is ready because... The thing you have to realize is, first of all, Casas is a much, much better prospect than any of the guys you've named. Yeah, right? I think that's it's the not, first thing. You don't you don't trade yeah. Casas to open the door for those guys. Yeah, um, it's it's not like yeah. this is a situation where, like, say you had a high minor shortstop, but you've got Marcelo Meyer coming up. And even then, I think Meyer's too far away to really plan much on. But it's like there's no comparison between Tristan Casas and, like, Blaze Jordan and Nico Cavadas. Yeah. For me right now. No, there isn't. So you They're don't very... give up six years of Tristan Casas because you've got Eric Hosmer at the league minimum. To me, Hosmer being at the league minimum makes him a very valuable potentially trade ship if he gets some of his value back next year. I um, agree. And frankly, I think it also opens the opportunity for you to keep him in like as like a bench, like multi, yeah. like like maybe he, he's a platoon DH slash bench guy or, you know, someone who starts three, four games a week. Like mm-hmm. when he's on that salary, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether it be but, trade or as a roster, as a bench type. Mm-hmm. All right. We got an email about, so we had the discussion about an eight ceiling last episode, Ian, or the episode before, I think it was the last episode. Um, so uh, actually let me read this email and I'm, I'll, I'll read a post from our forum about that. But he says, hi, guys, I distinctly remember Anderson Espinosa getting an eight ceiling at some point, which is correct. Um, just listening to your Friday podcast, and I think you say that you haven't given a pitcher that ceiling. So, yes, we were wrong. Honestly, he was so sensational at age 18 with comparisons to Pedro. It didn't feel crazy to me. A couple Tommy Johns later, obviously, things changed. Thanks, uh, Etan. Um, we had a poster post on the forum. He went back, and this was this poster. His name is LT Lurker. This post, Ian, I don't know if you saw it. It was from August the 17th. Um, he went back through the internet archive and found all the guys we gave eight ceilings to. Um, we started using the two eight to the 2080 scale on fe- in February of 2013. Um, uh, pr- particularly between February 1st and 10th, we made the switch. He didn't look at every single update, but checked several from each season. It seems fairly safe to say the only players ever to have a, a ceiling of eight pr- prior to Miguel Blaze including two at the same time, including a pitcher, were Xander Bogarts, Anderson Espinosa, Yohan Moncada, Rafael Devers. Sounds right to me. Um, Xander Bogarts was a 10 ceiling for a couple of years prior to our grading change. We used to use a 1 to 10 scale. Um, and then for, he was an 8 ceiling from then until he graduated. He's the only player I found that had an 8 for a current projection, which... That we would not do now by any stretch. Um, we used to be we used to do our grading very very different. Well, no, it was um, an eight out of ten though, right? No, I think he was saying he might have had an eight projection. Oh no, he wouldn't have had it. Maybe no, he was he an eight current There's projection no on the it ten scale. Yeah, we, we, we would never have done it. Sure. We would have done, maybe no done a he, seven. 
Yeah. No. Yeah. Maybe did a seven. I would. I would. I would have presumed a six. I would never I could've... put a seventy on a prospect. Like, well, I, no, yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. No, I get that. Um, okay. Yeah. So he's clearly the, the Sox prospects Hall of Fame prospect. Moncada, Devers, Swire, and Nero all had current projections of seven at one time or another with the current scale, but that's not an exhaustive list. But again, we we used to use the scale much much differently than we do now. Espinoza was an eight from July 2015 when he debuted in the top 20 at number 11. Again, very different use of the scale at that point. Um, and held his eight until a trade in July of the following year. He was the only eight with a floor of two and held the eight longer than anyone but Xander Bogarts. Oh, debuted in the top 20. He was ranked lower with a lower ceiling, but when we bumped him up, we eventually gave him the eight. Moncada ceiling was first and eight in September of 15, dropped to a seven in April. Only to return to an eight, uh, sorry, in April of 2016, return to an eight in September of 2016 and remain there until he was traded. Um, Devers had the ceiling of an eight. Bonus under the old system, Casey Kelly had a ceiling of a 10. Uh, Lars Anderson, Clay Buckholtz, and Michael Almanzar all had ceilings of 10 in 2009. So great research. That's the answer to the question we had. That was before my time. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for doing that research, LT Lurker, if you listen. Um, which I presume you do because you responded to it. Uh, next question. Uh, again, and we're going to get a lot of Miguel Blaze projection, our uh, projection questions and ceiling questions. Um, this is from Tom. He says, I don't remember exactly what Myers floor was coming out of the draft for the website, but I know it was certainly a lot, I, but I know it was a lot higher than Blaze is right now. The website has Blaze is currently with a floor of a 20. We just made that a 30 in the most recent update. Um, Blaze is 18, same as Meyer was a year ago. I understand your concerns with giving Blaze a higher floor comes with him growing into his body, but this wasn't voiced with Meyer a year ago as he was also 18 in the complex league and with plenty of room to project physically. I even remember hearing that Meyer never even hit the weight room in high school, which meet this is me now. That was, I think a bit of an exaggeration. Um, my, I guess my question is why is it fair to have this concern with Blaze resulting in giving him a 20 floor when Meyer didn't have this a year ago, interested in your thought process. Um, first of all, again, we've given Blaze the three floor. We, we changed that after this year. Um, the thing you've got to remember with Blaze is he debuted when he was an international signee, um, and was in the DSL. So, you know, changing that grade required him coming over, you know, seeing him over stateside, you know, seeing what he could do in the Florida complex league, getting reports on him. And then we made the change with Meyer. There's just so much more scouting foundation on a player in the United States who's a first half of the first round draft prospect than there is on an international signee, that that's part of why when a guy gets signed, especially internationally, we give him the wider error bars and narrow them as we get a better sense of the player. Um, does that all sound right to you, Ian? And do you have anything to add or that you would disagree with? Yeah, no, it agrees. And I, I think you got to remember too, that when Blaze is first rank, he's 16, like Meyer, when we ranked him was either 18 or 19. So yeah. there's, there's a big difference um, when you're initially ranking those guys. And I think it's just harder. As you said, the biggest thing is just the information gap when the international signees come over, especially with instructs, not really being a thing anymore. We don't yeah. really have information on them until they make their stateside debut at spring training. Or um, if they don't participate in that, like Luis Perales is a good example of that mm -hmm. until we get scout feedback on them from the FCL. So that can take, you know, there could be a good, you know, year, year and a half, two years where they're in the system where we just don't have a lot of information on them. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're a lot more li likely to have a much bigger error bar there because we just don't know. So we're going to leave it, you know, kind of like a loose projection. Agree. All right. Our next email, Ian, is from our friend John Berman over at CNN. Long time listener, first time caller, he says. Um, you choose both short because I know that's how you like them. Um, and we'll do them both, man. You're, you, he's been a big time supporter of the, of the website for a while. Um, we appreciate you, John, and happy to answer both of these questions, man. Um, first one, Ian, which member? of the top 10 or 20 has surprised you the most this year on the upside or downside for good or bad. Um, I'll let you go first unless you uh, want a sec to think about it, in which case I will come up with someone. I, I mean, I think but, it's, it's, it's Raffaella has shown just a lot more at the plate than I realized he had a um, lot more potential at the plate than I realized he had and shot mm -hmm. his way into the top 10 as, as a result of that. Mm -hmm. I like that. The other one that I would probably throw out, Oh, I guess he's not in the top 20. I was going to say Nico Cavadas, but he's a, he's a 22. Yeah. Um, I guess Nathan Hickey, now that he's in the top 20, um, fifth rounder, I was a, very surprised he got a million dollar signing bonus. Um, but after seeing him in person, I kind of get it. Um, I really like what he does at the plate. 
Um, so he's a guy who upside really kind of surprised me what I saw from him this year and how he's, how he's done this year. Um, but I'm with you on Rafaela too. I think Rafael is the first answer there um, for sure, especially if you're narrowing to top 10. And John's other question was a history question. Um, who is the most surprising Red Sox draftee that you have seen become a genuine contributor at the major league level? Which I guess kind of depends on your definition of genuine contributor. Um, I don't know if you've got anyone in mind, Ian, because it's, here's the thing. The obvious answer of like player in the system surprising is Daniel Nava, no question, right? But he's an indie ball signee, uh, not a drafty, but you know, a guy getting signed out of indie ball, really old, um, coming into the system, and then not only making the majors, but becoming like a regular or semi regular for like a what was it, a three year period or something? By far the most surprising, I think, since I've been doing this, um, to become a regular contributor at the level. Um, some other guys I can think of another one that has come through the system that again, I think he was an indie ball signee, although he might've just been an undrafted free agent is Chris Martin, the pitcher who's now with the Braves Ian, or the Dodgers. Dodgers. He got traded at the deadline. He was that's the right. Cubs. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Chris Martin kind of coming out of nowhere to become like a multi-year now setup man in major league baseball was another guy who was really surprising and like just where they came from. I don't know that there's been a whole lot of, um, you know, we had a guy ranked in the fifties and he winds up having an extensive major league career type type situation. I mean, you get relievers who, you know, maybe come up and stick around for longer than you might think like a Brazier or something, maybe, um, which is, um, probably I, not think, the time I, I think, him. I think I, I have one, okay. uh, Mauricio Dubon. Ooh, like that one. 26 like round one. pick, um, signed for a lot, 100K. You know, there's just not a lot on him. Um, and he's carved out a really, really nice major league career. And I think that he's uh, he's someone who, um, obviously, he was traded pretty early on in his career. But mm-hmm. the fact that he, um, he's he been around and, you know, is still kicking it um, over with the Astros now, I think. Yeah, after a, getting traded. Pretty, yeah, he was the answer him. to the, um, it used to be called Wardle, like W A R D L E. I think they now just call it like MLB. I forget what they call it, but it's like a you know guess the player game. It was the answer yeah. the other day. It was kind of fun. Well, I, I think also it's just that like as you said, like relievers hat like pop like weird relievers make the the big leagues or later sure. round picks. I, I think it's rare to see like Ryan a, Presley, a, a high school position player um, who signs for like a hundred k. To that's just not the profile of guy. Or not even high school leagues. position player. That's like underselling him so short, right? Like it's like guy who like talks his way to the u.s from he's honduran right uh like, i thought it was nicaragua but it could be honduras i feel like it's honduras we should we, we should we should double check that. no i'm, I'm checking it right now difference. yeah it's honduras yeah it's honduras, it's honduras. okay nicaragua right, yeah. was uh deverne hansack the nicaragua oh, yeah. he's now, a, he's now a fisher fisherman yeah um but yeah no um yeah that that's and you always get guys who sign for like small bonuses internationally that pop because uh, like I think like degrees. so the, the other the other person I was considering was Travis Shaw, mm-hmm. but Travis Shaw like I've seen Ninth like high, yeah. high school uh, excuse me college like performers who get drafted in later rounds like undergo a swing change or kind of figure something out and put together a nice big league career consistently. Yeah, um, it's I just think it's rare to see a high schooler be able to like yeah and I've, I've, I don't, like that I like Shaw because the thing with Shaw is I think. The career, the fact that he was like an above average hitter in Major League Baseball years. for like two or three years was very surprising to me. Yeah. For a guy that surprised me from where he was in the high minors. Like I figured he'd be a major, it would seem pretty clear at some point he was going to be a major leaguer. Um, but yeah, that was surprising. And then you've also got the guys that like moved to the bullpen, like Williams Harris and Jordan Weems. If you want to ask me about like someone who surprised me the most, the fact that Nick Duran is still a big leaguer. Oh my gosh! Wild yeah, to me, yeah, like yeah, yeah. that that one. Like I thought his stuff was very good, but I just feel like it's rare that you see like a guy who gets released from Greenville, who had an eight ERA when the Red Sox released him, get off to the big leagues this year with the Phillies. I think was it the Phillies? Yeah. Phillies. Yep. Um, that was someone. There, there's been some ones like that, like Nick Duran getting up, or um, 
yeah, there's been some pitchers like that. But as we said, like the pitchers things happen, which is why I'm uh which is why Dubone I think fits the best because he's actually, you know, played there for several years now. Yeah, I'm looking at the active X prospects on our on our X prospects page, Ian, and the fact that like Chris Martin topped out at 33 with the career he's carved out no, for himself. Oh, I think that, that's perfectly fine. Well, but I'm just saying the fact that it, like you don't see guys who never break into the top 30 or not never, but it's it's the length of his career is what I'm talking yeah, about. Like, I, guess I could see him being being a setup guy for two he, or three years. But fine, he, but I think we're going on we're going on like six years at this point. But he's a unique case because he was like 27 or 30 or something when 20 we were ranking it. Oh, he no. was 24 when they signed him out of Indy yeah. Ball. But but when we were ranking him, he was still like in his late 20. He was like 25, 26, he, 27. He 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 left the organization after his age 27 year. Yeah, um, which was I mean, 2013, so. but I'm saying that's 2013. So the yeah. fact that he debuted in MLB in 2014 and he's been in MLB full time since like 19 at this point. Um, yeah. Although he spent he spent a little bit of time in Gwinnett this year, but I'm assuming that that was um, or last year, but I'm assuming that that was like rehab could have been a rehab or something. I think that was rehab. Uh, but anyway, yeah, great questions. Of course, it, you know, I think another one, can, another yeah, another go good one's Hunter Strickland. He's now like, yeah. But he, but was, he was a closer traded. for a he, time. He was also was traded so early in his Red Sox career. Yep. Um, but the fact that he's obviously he made it to the big leagues for the first time in 2014, and now we're you know 2022, and he's now I think he's closing for Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean, great. Thanks for the questions, John. You know, the the asking people questions thing and, and like interviewing them, you should probably look into that um as like a career or something. Uh, our next email comes from Tim and he says, this is an easy one. Hey guys, is Alex Cora's job safe? Obviously sent before Sam Kennedy said as much. I absolutely is. I don't see what you can put from this season on Alex Cora. Yeah, no, it's, Cora, it's, Cora is a core. will be back. Yeah, I, it's, I, I it's, would not, it's I a team. It's a team. To me, it's much more of a, a team um, building thing than a manager thing. Their problems. I would, year. I would not. I don't think they should change anything. I think that no. this year has been kind of fluky. They've had a ton of injuries and they just all happen to have, they were missing like nine regulars for July. Like you're going to be bad if you're missing that many guys. And I, I think that, sure. that the la- the injuries um, just magnified some of the issues they had on the roster. And I think that's, what's kind of led to the demise of them over the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just things like that happen when you have that many injuries. Our next question. And the reason I'm doing this one, Ian, because I know we usually get, give it its own segment at some point around this time of year, but I, I, I could see them announcing these guys before our next episode. Um, our own, our own Eddie hand who works for the site sent in a question. He says, just wondering who you think are good bets to be assigned to the Arizona fall league. And how does one go about predicting that? Uh, good question. And you usually get asked about that around this time of year. Um, as far as how well, I did a projection the other day and I I'm trying to find it on the forum, but usually think double a ish talent level although it has kind of trended lower in recent years Ian, you see more like high a guys going good bets are usually guys who missed time due to injury um have to make up at bats or innings pitched top prospects at around that level that the team wants to get more reps um usually always a catcher usually um yeah you know there's just some kind of archetypes you sort of learn over time uh i think is the way that i would that i would put it as far as my projection but there's a thread and i cannot find it so let me give me one minute oh here it is okay so here's who i've got and tell me what you think of this ian so my projection for who they're going to send this year um starting with the hitters catcher steven scott second baseman nick york um, yeah, I don't know about the York, but um, really, like I, just, I could, I see I why you would it. say no. I could see why, like, I could see it either way because he's missed so much time due to injury. But at the same time, it's like maybe just shutting it down is better. Exactly, right? I completely get that. I originally had say Don Rafaela. Mm, I don't see that. Why don't you see that? Just the injury. We don't know what's going on with that. Oh, oh, this was before. So he got hit on the hand by a pitch a week ago and has yeah. not played since. That's a fair Correct. point. The yeah. reason that I'm doubting that now is it just got announced he's playing Puerto R- in Puerto Rico for Caguas. When does that winter. start? Um, I think you can still, in theory, do Arizona, but it doesn't happen often that guys do yeah. both. So I could I, see I think, them shutting him down for the fall and sending him to Puerto Rico. 
I think Christian Koss would be my pick of a middle infielder to go. I could see Christian Koss, especially getting him more versatility. Yeah. I at one point had Alex Benellis, but at this point I'm thinking, do you just shut him down and let him figure out what's up with his swing? Mm -hmm. I could see Matthew Lugo, but again, he might play in Puerto Rico. So maybe you just shut him down and let him play in Puerto Rico. Um, so I've had some kind of modification and, and, you know, wondering about how I would change my, uh, my projection there. Um, any yeah, other players pick- you think? Well, I think pitchers, I think that Hitter, well, hitters. Yeah, yeah. So my pitchers no. who I had first almost dad ward, no question. Yeah, I That's don't think that, yeah. super easy. No question needs the reps right level. Mm-hmm. Stat, that, he, 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 I, I would put him in pen on my projection. Yeah. Um, the next one, I, I was, it's, it depends who they want to get innings. And I don't know if the 40 man roster matters. So like, I don't know if you could send Brian Mata. Yeah. If you wanted him to get innings, um, at the time, I don't know what the deal is with Brandon Walter. If Brandon I Walter were able to pitch, I would think about it, but I think he's done for the year because, uh, I, uh, he was mentioned in that article we were talking about earlier. Okay. By, uh, thing by um, i think their plan is to try and get him healthy for next season that makes perfect sense and it was just depending on when he was going to come back yeah um reliever types i know you like this one uh, ryan fernandez if he's healthy yeah, I, he's on the I il think, right now but no i question. think him and jacob wallace go i could relievers. see jacob wallace i go. also could see zephyr john going um, i could too um odonir mosqueda i could maybe see though he might just pitch in in the uh no he's venezuelan venezuelan league um, I also wondered about Michael Geddes, who I know is a guy that we went back and forth on uh, in the rankings thing. I could see him He's maybe a being a guy. agent, so he can't. Good point. Well, if they re-signed him. Um, yeah, and they've definitely but... sent minor league free agents in the past. Um, yeah, but they have to be signed. Do they... They, they become a minor league free agent right after the season. So like how after the they... World Series, the, if the fall league is going while the playoffs are, are going. Oh, yeah, I guess. The fall right. league is in like October. Fair. Fair. I forgot they moved it way up. It used to be like in November. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, no, it's, they've definitely sent guys who are going to be minor league free agents in the past. I think okay. I just remember that being a thing. I don't have the name in mind, but I remember that being a thing that happened. Yeah. Um, Just to get a look at a guy. So I could see that being like, do, you know, do we want to resign this guy? Mm-hmm. Um, Other are, I don't know, any other arms you think they could send? I mean, I could see maybe like Brian Van Bell, maybe if they kind of like him and want to get him like innings out of the bullpen just to build up the pitch count or something. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Victor Santos, if they need a, like um, another guy to be yeah. a starter. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. Usually you, they send one starting pitcher and three relievers, but sometimes the relievers are starters who work out of the bullpen, right? Like they've done that with Mata. They did that with um, not Hauk. Cause I think Hauk, Hauk was the starter when he went, but they've done that with starters and they just send them. And it's like, we're not, we're moving him to the bullpen. He's just going to work out of the bullpen to get innings. Um, yeah, I could still, I mean, usually it's yeah, guys who maybe have been hurt. Um, but yeah, that those are kind of the projections that that I think, you know, that list of names, maybe a William or a Breu. Although again, he, uh, you know, it, and by the way, there used to be a rule that if you were from a country like Mexico, Dominican, um, Venezuela that has a winter league, you couldn't play in the a- a- AFL. You can now. It's so like William or Breu, Venezuelan, but I could see them sending him maybe as a new guy. I don't know. Anyway. So those are that's that's the list. Uh, thank you for the email, Eddie. Appreciate it, man. Um, our next email, Ian, comes from Mike, not Mike from the website, but different Mike. He says, now that he's back playing, how has Nick York's defense looked? You answered that, but just wanted to say thank you for the email on that. Have his injuries thrown off this year? Again, we went into that. So thanks for the email. Hit that up earlier. Our next email comes from Ben, who asks, uh, when are when you are trying to evaluate a player's ability to do something that doesn't happen very often, but is still important as a major leaguer, how do you balance your in-person looks versus scouting the stat line? Do you approach, uh, in quotes, um, do you approach the in-person look any differently in these cases? The motivating example for this question is Costas is split against left-handed pitching. Um, you could see him three to four times in person. And if you're unlucky, you only see him hit against right-handed pitching, but obviously seeing him face a left-handed pitcher would be very helpful to understanding how he'll do in the majors. Other possible examples of this might be middle infield players speed at turning a double play might see one a game or catchers pop time and arm accuracy to catch base stealers might see multiple times in a game, or you might not see any in multiple games. Thanks, Ben. I, I get what he's saying. So how, 
I think it really comes down to this Ian, is how, how do you go about evaluating a specific skill or trait that you just don't see very often. And I have this problem when I get to see one or two games of a series and I'm trying to evaluate hitters, right? Because you might not see them get a pitch to hit all weekend. Um, you might see them face one really good pitcher who they, makes it look like they are not good. And th- you know, they were just facing a top 100 guy or something. Um, that's where I have the toughest time. Um, and I don't know how you go about it. Obviously you have to incorporate statistics to some degree, but you got to be careful when you do that too, because you got to know why that's com- where that's coming from. Why, you know, this year base stealing numbers are up because pitchers are limited in number of pickoffs and the bases are bigger and there's a pitch clock. And so you got to be careful about that. You know, um, th- there's a lot that you have to take into account. You can't just scout a guy's splits necessarily. It just gives you stuff to look for, but I'm curious what you think about that. Ian. Uh, I would usually just ask a scout who's seen them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say you can't just ask a scout. Um, I mean, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't write that is the that. answer though, is ask yeah, me, no, we have connections to people. We, we ask about these things, but yeah, to try I and would evaluate. Not, well, like I wouldn't write up, like I've seen them do that. Like I would note that I didn't see this in, um, when I'm writing a player up and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the only, the, the, the two options are go back until you see it. Or if that's not an option, you talk to someone in the game who has seen it, but like, if you can't do that, I, yeah, I would just, just, you kind of punt on the category or just say, you know, we haven't seen enough to evaluate that area. Um, I, mm-hmm. I don't love relying on the, 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 the statistics. Um, I think that, that they're definitely, especially the publicly available stuff leaves some gaps um, that, that, that cannot paint a clear picture. Um, if we had, you know, if you, if you have some of the more advanced data, I think that can be telling and can kind of be informative. But um, if you don't have access to that and you don't have access to, to connections, it's definitely hard. Our next question comes from Gav and he says, uh, hopefully, the, uh, let's see, the shift is going to be banned. Is the shift going to be banned next year? I don't think I it's don't, I not don't in think major it's leagues. It's not. Um, but he, his question is, is this something you take into account in your rankings? They're, they're testing the pie slice. I, I think at I, some I, levels. I could see that. I saw it at, I saw the one in, in Greenville, which was you can't have like three guys on the right side of the infield or left mm-hmm. side. I'm fine with that. Like, I, I don't really well, that's think not banning the, the sh- Yeah, sorry. I, I don't think banning the shift is the, the, the solution. I don't think it's going to come to MLB. I think that the thing that needs to be done is the pitch clock. But yeah, um, I don't think it's certain. I think they're testing. There's some of these that are like going to happen. Pitch clock is eventually coming. Robo ops is eventually coming. I don't want robo ops, but pitch clock. I Ooh, We'll have to talk about that in the future. Um, well, no, I would, I, what I want is I want the challenge system. I want like, I want umps calling it and the robo umps are backups. And if mm-hmm. you disagree with a call, you can like challenge it and it should take like five seconds, like tennis mm-hmm. Hawkeye does. Okay. But, um, um anyway, his, but yeah, his question, I, his question is, is this something you've been taking into account in your rankings? For example, yeah. which hitters can go oppo will now be more likely to put the ball in play versus, Oh, if whose glove and read isn't great, may become a bigger liability. I, I, no, I, I, no, I, it's part of the I game. Could, if you yeah. can field, I mean, maybe with like the shift, you can cover up more for a guy at second who's a defensive liability. I, I think the but, only one of those that you can take into account is if robo umps do come, um, then the catcher's ability to frame becomes less important. That's yep. the only one. Catcher defense is the only one where I think it's viable to, 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 and I could that. see, you know, I could also see, yeah, I could also see speed playing up a little bit more if you, have things like the pitch clock and limits on the number of pickoff moves and I don't but I don't bases. think those are going to happen. I think it I I just think the pitch mm. clock is the one the big one that's going to come soon. Yeah, or at least soon. I mean, I could see those things happening eventually. Um but we'll see. I mean, that's why they're testing these things in the full minors. Um our next question comes from Paul. Well, the thing is though we're seeing the oh, guys yeah. we're seeing the guys play under those conditions. So you like ha- like right. I don't even think right. about them when I'm at the game. Now that he's mentioned them like oh yeah, those are yeah. rules, but like I don't really think about them impact yeah. because i'll be honest i don't think they like they don't change the experience for me like well, i honestly it, yeah. forgot about like the shifting thing for example like i well, was just evaluating as is yeah and i mean like players who get shifted it's like you notice that they get shifted right but you're not basing their projection on the fact they're getting shifted they're getting shifted because they pull a lot of balls to that side of the infield and like that's what you're noticing and evaluating Right. So like, I don't know that I'm going to evaluate a guy differently because the, the shift does or doesn't exist. Um, next email is from Paul. He says, how I've heard much criticism of Bloom. And while some of it is valid, what do you think about his 
in parentheses, unwillingness to trade prospects. The value of a farm system is not simply to create homegrown big leaguers. It's also to trade for other teams, big leaguers. Bloom seems to just want to stock the farm, but doesn't seem to have a great feel for evaluating his own talent. Duran is a classic example. You guys have been spot on with his big league potential. So why isn't he traded or packaged up in a trade when he was a top 100 prospect and had some value? Now he has no value. I can hardly recall a move where Bloom has used the farm system in a trade to maximize value to the big club. Isn't that the point? You don't just hold on to everyone and hope some of them pan out. Cheers, Paul. And I read this because I think that, first of all, there's a misconception in there that I want to address with Duran. <clears throat> the idea that Duran had a ton more value because he was a top 100 prospect, I would push back heavily against. And I'd Yeah, there's a, huge, well. there's a huge disconnect between like what national prospect lists look like and what like teams do. Yeah, like, like I, you're not teams and t- teams knew if if I'll say this, like if I was saying something about Jaron Duran and like we obviously yeah. had certain questions about that have proven to be, you know, problematic at the major league level. Other teams knew the exact same things I did. Like there was yeah. a re- it was if you if you were going to those games and, you know, talking to people, you knew that. Um, So that he just that's that was one of the things where he never I don't think he ever had that value that that I think that people think he did in trades yeah um yeah he he had value don't get me wrong and he still has value but it was never like he was never going to be treated like a top 100 prospect in a trade Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as far as bloom being unwilling to move prospects aldo ramirez and kyle schwarber say hi i mean yeah i i don't i don't think i don't i don't agree with that i mean like he hasn't made a chris sale trade because he hasn't needed to make a chris sale trade because they had chris sale because right yeah like they, they, they haven't been in a position to do that. And when they needed to buy last year, they did those, the guys, he, the prospects he traded last year have not really like Alder Ramirez hasn't pitched this year. Um, I don't yeah, think I don't Ryan Presley like has pitched this year. Yeah. I think Alder Ryan Ramirez, Presley, I think had, uh, Ryan Presley, uh, Alex Scherf. I, for some reason, I think oh, of them as the yeah. same because they both got t- yeah, traded yeah, yeah. to the twins. Yes. Well, um, yeah. Kind of. Well, Presley, Presley was Presley rule five. traded to the twins. Oh, Presley was, was rule, rule five. five. Okay, whatever. Yep. I know the twins got him, but like yeah. I'm pretty sure Alder Ramirez comes had from. Tommy yep. John or some sort of injury. He had something in um, there. Like, there's no nationalsprospects.com, unfortunately. No, it says it says he won't pitch this year because mm-hmm. of an elbow thing. Mm, no um, good. he's got reoccur- reoccurring reoccurring soreness in his elbow all year. Um, but yeah, uh, I I think that that's not a fair narrative. Like I feel like they haven't been in a position where they've needed, or they've, you know, had the opportunity or ability to make that trade. And I think like this off season, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they traded prospect capital, to go get someone like Sean Murphy or, you know, a, a yep. big time position player uh, under team control. Mm-hmm. So um, or pitching. Yeah. they're going to need yeah. pitching. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't, I would very much strongly push back against that. And I also think that like, these off seasons have all been disrupted. Like this off season was disrupted by the lockout, obviously. So they couldn't make any moves from what November, December 1st until mm-hmm. end of March. Yeah. Um, year before was obviously the year before was the COVID year. Like, yeah, it's been it, a weird stretch. And he, the year before that, he was dealing with losing his manager on the eve yeah, and, of the season. And Mookie Betts, right? And Mookie, Wasn't that and, the year before yeah, that? And made the Mookie so, Betts trade. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like there yeah. isn't, he hasn't had like a normal consistent off season yet. So yeah. like, I think you need to be patient with high and bloom and give him I'm, time to make mm-hmm. moves and kind of build a, build his team. I'm very much of the mind of like, we can't really evaluate bloom until we get to this point next year or like just after the season next year and see what the yeah, team looks this like. is a very important off season. I feel like if you asked him, he would say the same thing. Like they have a ton of money coming off the books. They have a lot of holes on their roster and the way they construct the team this off season, I think is going to be very telling for what they view as their short-term and long-term ability, like kind of goals. Mm-hmm. And um, they, there's a lot to do. It's going to be a, it's good. There's a lot of work to be done this off season. Next emails from John B. The beginning of it, he asks about Matthew Lugo. And I think we answered that, but he wanted to ask why hasn't Lugo moved up to Portland? I know he's blocked by costs, but shouldn't cost be in Worcester at this point anyway. I don't know that I agree with that. I mean, I could see well, Lugo he's in not Portland. Blocked, he, he's not blocked by costs because Cost is playing shortstop every day. And Lugo, as we said, has played twice there in the last right. month. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah. It, it's not it, it's not that he's blocked. I think they're they're getting him used to third base in Greenville, and it's like in the infield in Portland, you've got Hamilton, Benellis, Koss, Cavadas, Nick Northcutt, um, all getting time, and Sidon Rafaela gets a game at short once a week when he's healthy. So I, I think, I think if they thought bodies. he was ready for a promotion, they would. I still think he has developmental areas that he needs to improve Agreed. both defensively and offensively, especially with his approach. And I think that's what they think that Greenville is the right level for him to to maintain his development right now or progress in his development. 
Um, Patreon supporter Pat in Londonderry, New Hampshire asks, uh, can you explain what buying out arbitration years really means? And are there any rules to it that the casual fan may not know? So what that means is so a team controlled player for the first three years just kind of has to accept whatever contract the team offers him more or less, which is usually close to and not super far above the major league minimum. Well, no, don't they not have to accept it? Didn't like Mookie Betts? Well, just, like, they don't have to accept it, but it, well, they don't have to accept it, but then they just like get tendered it and like, right. That's what I mean. But it's like, yeah. you can like, they get paid dismay. with the team. You yeah. can show your dismay though, by like no, just Fair. re-upping without actually signing it or whatever. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess what I'm saying is they get paid with the team says they're getting paid. Um, in years four through six to oversimplify a bit, you go to arbitration and there are times when you might have four arbitration years if you're a super two, but, um, that's a process by which you, you know, you're, you, you're, you're essentially paid. Like, I think it's supposed to be like 40%, 60%, 80% of your market value, more or less. It doesn't quite wind up working out that way, but that's why guys always get raises, um, in fact, there's like a rule about how much your salary can be from what it, like go down from the year before, but it never goes down. Um, buying out those years just means like signing a guy ahead of time. That's all it means. Um, so it means signing a guy to a contract extension. So instead of a guy getting a new contract every year, he gets signed to one contract. And what that usually winds up looking like is um, Julio Rodriguez example. Julio Rodriguez's extension is not like you know, whatever the average value is spread out the same over every year. He's not getting, he's not making 20 million next year. He's going to make a much lower amount because he's like a second or third year player or second year player and then a third year player. And then his arbitration years, the money will go up to be like kind of what he would have made in arbitration. And then it's going to be what he would have made on the market or like his like full value in the contract or whatever it is. And he's got all these escalators and things like that. But like those long-term contracts go up in such a way that arbitration years are not valued the same as post-arb years. But buying those out, that's just a way of saying that you signed a guy to an extension for arbitration seasons. There's not, there's no rule about it. It is not a special process. It is just how it is referred to. Um, but again, thank you for the question. And um, yeah, glad we were able to answer that, answer that one. Next question is from our friend Aaron, Ian, and he... <laughs> It's interesting. He says two two topics, if I may. First, please discuss the Joey Manessa situation because it's kind of blowing my mind. After 23 games in the majors in DC, he's got a uh, OPS over a thousand. Clearly, this isn't sustainable. But is there anything in there that seems at all real? And if so, did the Red Sox not do enough to unlock it? It's hard not to notice that a good bat at first base would have been useful this year. Um, I think the simple answer is small sample size. I looked at it. He's already coming down from his hot start. Um, he was like really good the first week, week and a half, and it's already starting to come back down to earth. I don't know if you've got anything to add on Joey Manesis. Kaba Joey. Um, his second question is, what do we think Ryan Brazier has on Alex Cora to still be getting innings on this team? I mean, I cl- like the, 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 clearly the Red Sox, if someone thinks or someone sees that, I don't know whether it's the pitch data or like he shows flashes because he, he does it, you know, he'll show the good stuff that he's shown in the past in spurts. There's just no consistency there, but um, yeah, I I mean he he um he, he definitely needs to to figure some stuff out and kind of mm-hmm. get back to how he was pitching. I think it was a couple weeks ago he had a good stretch, um, because obviously right now he's he's really struggling. A couple more questions for they're pretty quick. One first is from Christian. He asks how Brian Mata might fit into the MLB pitching staff between now and 2023, if at all, given the late promotion is 2022 still too soon. Yeah, if they had any designs on bringing him up this year, he would have been in Worcester much sooner. Um, um, can I just circle back on Brazier for a second? Like, sure. if you look at his Savant page, like his chase rate is among the highest in baseball. He's got good velocity, good extension. Like, there are some characteristics or traits that teams look for in pitchers. And mm-hmm. I think that's why he keeps getting a shot is like he does have some favorable metrics out there. Obviously, the performance hasn't matched them. But, you know, he doesn't walk people. He gets a lot of chases. He has a big velocity. He gets good extension. Like, that's a, that's a lot of boxes that teams look for in pitchers. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the Red Sox clearly think there's some untapped potential that they, they're they trying to kind of right the ship with there. Yep, fair, fair. Um, anything on Mata? I think, he, I think he's in the mix for I, next year, no question. In some yeah, way. I mean, I don't, I don't think some he'll, point. he's not going to break camp with the team. But I think no. that he's likely to be started. He'll start the season in AAA. Um, and potentially, you know, could be one of the the major league depth arms next season because obviously he's on the forty man, and I think that's next year might be his. I don't know he's got two options left, 
But um, so yeah, uh, I, I assume we'll see him at some in some capacity at some at some point next year. And our next email for this episode, Ian, the, the last email for this episode is from our uh, Patreon supporter, Forrest Perkins, who says, looking ahead to next season, what do you think Connor Siebold's and Josh Winkowski's roles will be? Are they starter depth in the bullpen or on a different team? What do you predict and what do you think would be best? I'll let you start if you would like. I think they're both, they both start the season as AAA starter depth. Concur. Concur. And what do you think would be best? I mean, I think that's best as well. And then I think their future role is probably like, Piggyback starter bullpen type situation, but like, yeah, I, I think the reason why you wouldn't. Def- Win- Winkowski is yeah. definitely a reliever to me, um, or he should be a reliever in my opinion. Yeah. Um, Seabold, I go back and forth on it. Just depends on the stuff. He might just be like a depth minor league, like you know, sixth, seventh, yeah. eighth starter type. It just depends if his stuff comes back because it's obviously been down a little bit of late. I mean, it's interesting because next year at AAA, in theory, if Walter's healthy again, you've got Bayo, Mata, Walter, Murphy, Seabold, Santos. Um, and then maybe Ward, although maybe he starts in double A. Um, but you know, I mean, part of that might depend, like, is it possible that Bayo breaks camp with the major league club? I don't think that's out of the question. Uh, probably depends on what they do. If I had to project it right now, I think Bayo does. I mean, if they keep him up the rest of the season, I think he breaks camp with the big leagues. I think he probably does. And I think, especially the thing is just like, he has the last three, four starts. Yeah, and our projection right now, I mean, we've got Winkowski and Crawford up on the major league roster. Like, I could easily see either of them in AAA as well. Um, I, think I think Crawford. Breaks, I think Crawford. Breaks breaks I just don't. Th- I just don't think he's a starter either. I think Bullpen. he'll be one of one of the long relievers next year. Bullpen. Yeah, I agree. Or you know, just in the bullpen generally, I think that's a good role for him. I, I, I don't know. Maybe they see something they like from him as a starter this year. But yeah, I would say. You know, it depends on what they do with Whitlock, too. Like he he's shown spurts as a starter. It's just the lack of consistency, I think, stems back to just he's not a natural starter with his pitch mix and his delivery. Yep. I hear you. Cool. All right. Um, anything else? I think that's I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you all for listening. We appreciate it. We know this has been a long one. We appreciate you. Hold hold them tight during our uh, brief hiatus, but we're back. Uh, of course, you can follow us on Twitter, follow the site at Sox Prospects on Twitter and Instagram. Follow Ian on Twitter at, uh, at Ian. Uh, follow Ian on Twitter at Ian Cundall. That's I A N C U N D A L L. And follow me at S P Chris Hatfield. Um, shout out to our five dollar level Patreon supporters. That'd be Deb Ken- Deb Kendall, Andrew Wallen, Lendl Martin, Ernest Shermer, Kyle C, Tyler Woodrow, Mr. Walsh, um, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, uh, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Evan, Evan Kirkwood, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon. Ben and R.I., David B., Ben Burnett, Al Mendel, Kevin Catridi, Stephen Greg- Steve Gregory, James Bailey, Andreas Goldstrand, Corey Parrott, Mark Herman, Brian Cowan, Andrew Kay, Jeff Harwood, Just- Dusty G., Michael Murphy, Bob Introne, Pavel, Jordan Shabbat, Jeffrey Scruggs, Mike Kawano, Chris Bollier, Curtis Waltman, Michael Stewart, Caleb Farron, John Kane, Jason Stoneburner, Jason Parker, Mike Mignosa, Jeff Richardson, Eric Peterson, Michael Cullen, John McGee, Nicholas Lenson, Paul Manish, James P. McMahon, Jim Tuttle, Adam Gregory, and our newest $5 level supporters, Brian Rose and Jake O'Donnell. Thank you all for your support. Uh, make sure you, and also just to draw, mention this one more time, send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We've got a couple that we saved for later episodes just that they're a little more involved, but send them in. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So that's it. Thank you for listening. For Ian, I'm Chris. We'll be back in your eardrums soon, y'all. Thanks a lot.